didn't I think of this sooner? Yeah! Great idea, Wally! Huh? So, uh, you guys seem to like my pony video, like, a lot. At the time of recording this, it currently has over 70k views, so thanks for that, I really appreciate it. And because that video did so well, I thought it'd be fun to do another episode ranking video, but with a different show. And if you couldn't tell by the title and thumbnail already, that show was codenamed Kids Next Door. Now why Kids Next Door you may be asking? Well, it's because earlier this year I felt like rewatching the movie Operation Zero. After I rewatched watched it, I gained an interest in rewatching the whole series, which is why I decided to make this video. Anyway, I'm going to quickly give my history with the show as well as explain how I rank each episode. If you don't care about either of those and just want to skip right to the rankings, then you can skip to this time. Iridocyclitis. As a kid, I watched a lot of cartoons, and the best place to watch cartoons used to be Cartoon Network. There were tons of shows that aired on it, and a good chunk of them were great. And of course, one of those shows was Kids Next Door. K&D was never one of my all-time favorites, like like Samurai Jack, Ben 10, Teen Titans, or Billy and Mandy, but it was still a show I liked quite a lot. There were tons of memorable villains, it had cool 2x4 technology, solid character designs, and even some cool lore too. Even as an adult, there's some small details that are easy to miss. For example, did you ever notice that the team's roles are specially named in the end credits? Take a look at this. Composer Commando, Secret Script Coordinator, Radium Powered Recording Facility, and plenty of other this is something that most people probably wouldn't notice, but it's cool that the team put them in. Anyway, K&D was a show I watched a lot growing up. However, despite watching it whenever I was able to, I never actually finished it, or at least I don't think I did. Season 6 was definitely the season I was the least familiar with, and I'm pretty sure I've never even seen treaty or interviews before. So it was cool to finally sit down and watch the series from start to finish, especially since there are overarching plots in the show. I Okay, let's explain the rules and how my rankings work. First off, yes, I will be ranking every single episode of the series. Unlike my pony ranking though, I will include both the movie, the Billy and Mandy crossover, and the finale interviews. If you don't think these episodes should count for whatever reason, then you can just ignore them, I guess. Second, I will be keeping my thoughts on most episodes somewhat brief. I don't have too much to say about a majority of them, but some I do. So because of that, the amount of time I'll be discussing an episode will vary. Third, there are going to be at least some episodes that you disagree with me on, and that's completely okay. There are going to be episodes that you like that I don't, and ones that I like that you don't. If you want to discuss your thoughts on an episode, or multiple episodes, then comment below. Fourth, unlike my pony ranking, I will not be using IMDB as a source for how the fandom feels about each episode. That's because, on average, only about 80 users have scored each episode, which is isn't a lot. Also, every single episode except for the first is rated an 8 or higher, which is definitely not accurate. This is also weird considering the show itself has only a score of 7.2. Now, why am I bringing this up? Well, in my pony ranking, I used phrases like hot take when describing some episodes. Because I didn't want to watch and read hours of reviews, I simply used IMDB as a source for how the fandom feels about each episode. However, I can't do that this time, so I'm just going to to say whatever the hell I want. Fifth, I will be rating each episode on a score of 1 to 10, however, spoilers, the lowest score given is only a 3. I got a couple comments on my pony ranking saying that I was being too harsh on some of the worst episodes. Some people even thought I was over exaggerating and just hating on them for comedy, but no, I wasn't. Some of those episodes are still god awful and offensive. There are some really bad episodes in K&D, but they aren't anything horrendous. Sixth, the rankings for each episode does matter, although some are interchangeable. It's even more difficult this time to rank the episodes since the majority of them are only 11 minutes instead of 22. Basically, the rankings matter, but don't take them too seriously. I'll say what I said in my pony ranking. If there's a 10 ranking gap between episodes with the same rating, then I think the higher episode is only ever so slightly better than the lower one. That also means that just because an episode has the same rating as another 
one doesn't mean it's just as good as it. Seventh, I'll be rating each episode mainly based on my enjoyment with them. This means that if I found an episode to be boring, then I'm going to rank it low. Although, thankfully, most of the bad episodes are bad due to rating, not because they're boring. If you like any of these episodes, then good for you. I'm glad you could enjoy them where I couldn't. Finally, I'm the harm reviewer, meaning I review harms, and it turns out that KND is in fact a harm. Number 4 is liked by number 3, number 86, and even Lizzie. So yes, KND is a harem, I'm legally allowed to review it, and that's what I'm going to do now. I'm Glenn Quagmire. So, at the very bottom, we have the 3 out of 10s. These are easily the worst episodes in the show. They're pretty bad and not fun to watch. They aren't god-awful or anything, they just suck. And the worst of them is... What is that? love. This might be controversial since I can see people enjoying this, but I obviously didn't. I'm not a fan of the whole play thing, it's unique and all, but I was mainly just bored. The singing isn't good and it's not even so bad that it's funny either. <laughs> My ears. Eh. I wasn't even invested in the fight scene and I began waiting for the episode to end. It's also crazy seeing this episode after Food Fight, which is spoilers, an amazing episode, and also another art episode. For those who don't know, every season has one art episode besides season 4 which has two and season 5 which has none. <laughs> These episodes are usually very experimental, such as Fly where there's no dialogue and the only sound is music. With this episode, it's supposed to be a musical and a pair of West Side Story and other gay Broadway plays, I think. I wouldn't know though, I fell asleep in my Broadway class like three times in college. Anyway, this is supposed to be a musical, yet only half of it is. After that, it just turns into a regular fight scene, which is disappointing since it feels like any other episode. But yeah, that was the worst episode of Codename Kids Next Door, and it was pretty bad, although I don't hate it. Like every episode, even the bad ones, there are some decent jokes, plus it helps that this is only 11 minutes long. However, despite its short length, it's still... <laughs> Mustache cash stash. Shave. I really don't get this episode. So there's a bunch of mustaches and they're evil or I guess not really. They just want to live on someone's face even though they take over the person's mind when they do, which is sort of not good. My main problem is that it's pretty boring. It's really stupid, but not in a good way and it's also annoying and very unfunny. I normally find the over-exaggerated accents in the show funny, but this just wasn't doing it for me. Also, also, the whole mustache concept in general didn't work either. Like, I get it, kids don't want to grow mustaches, but I don't know, I didn't find it funny. The show has inanimate objects come to life, and usually they work, but this is one of the rare times where it doesn't and fails. <laughs> Diaper. In Operation Hospital, there's this one part where number one thinks babies are being turned into adults at hospitals. It's a great joke, but I didn't want to see an entire episode about it. This episode consists of evil babies that cry and also scream, both of which I can't stand. Tara Strong voices the one baby and it sounds awful and annoying. <laughs> Now I'm not saying babies and shows equals bad. Operation Cable is decent and the boss baby is amazing, even though I've only seen the first few minutes of it. It's just that these babies are annoying and unfunny, so I get nothing out of them. At the very least, there are some great moments. Number one singing is funny, the babies were all born on 9-11 and the end credits is hilarious too. Number five tells everyone where babies come from and it's just their reactions for 30 seconds. Wait a second. Second, that's preposterous. Babies don't come from New Jersey. They come from Philadelphia. Well, those were the three out of tens, so now it's time to move on to the four out of tens. These episodes are bad. Nothing offensive, but still some of the show's worst episodes. It's over, isn't it? Interviews. That's it. 
that's the ending. After watching the entire show, this is the ending we got. I know I'm definitely not the only one who dislikes this, but I've seen some people say they do enjoy it. I can see why people enjoy this finale, since a good chunk of it is mostly decent. It's another cake episode, which I don't have a problem with, despite this being the seventh one. The series started with a cake episode, so I guess it makes sense to end it with one too. Also, half of the episode really isn't about the cake, since half of it is a big scavenger hunt. During the hunt, there's a bunch of callbacks to past episodes, and we get to see so many characters make an appearance. There's Robin Food, the Tuba Kid, the Cheese Shogun, the Rainbow Monkey Cereal. So much is crammed into this episode, and it's great. Even the end credits has a still from every single episode, which is really cool. It's a big love letter to the series and helps make this feel like a big finale. Also, Potty Mouth is in it, so that's amazing. But that's about all this episode does that's good, since there are some huge problems with it. First off is the whole real life interview segments which are very bizarre and jarring. I don't know why these segments are live action and they don't feel like they belong in the show whatsoever. Yes there are some short live action segments in the show but those are all just quick multiple second gags and they're great. However these take up a good couple minutes of the episode and they just feel very out of place. I'm fine with the idea of having Sector V be grown up and being interviewed but again why is it live action? Numbers 3 and 5 look okay, I guess, but I couldn't even recognize numbers 2 and 4. Number 2 looks like an old obese John Lasseter, and number 4 does not look like number 4 at all. They don't even sound or act well either, especially the acting. And my dim-witted husband was- I was- I- was- I- wait. But I- where was I? This feels like fans doing bad impressions of their favorite characters and it's really bad and awkward. It honestly feels like I'm watching a segment from this. You could stop at five or six doors or just one. I can't stand it when she touches me. Also, everyone has their memories back now, even though they all should have been decommissioned. How does this work? I don't know, the episode never bothers explaining this. It also makes less sense when you realize that Father was the one who recommissioned them, not the current KND. Anyway, besides that, Sector V lets the delightful children get away with their cake, which irritates 362. She decides to give the mission to her little brother, number 363, since he's completed all of his missions, without failing once. But the thing is, this doesn't make any sense at all. She says that out of the six times Sector V has done a cake mission, they've only gotten the cake back once, which isn't true. In the first cake episode, they don't get the cake, but Laura kills them, so I count that as a draw. I hate coconut. In cake two and five, the entire cake gets splattered everywhere so everyone can eat it, so that's a win. In cake three, they do eat the cake, but it's covered in bird shit, so that counts as a draw. Same goes for cake four, where they don't even get to make the cake at all. The only time where they outright lose is in cake six, where the delightful children get away with the cake and eat it. But besides that, Sector V has won every other time, or at least didn't lose. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty good track record. Also, it's not just the cake missions either. Remember in It when number one helped her become leader of the KND again? If not for him, every kid in the world would be eating broccoli every day. And also, remember that one tiny time where number one saved the entire fucking planet from being turned into old zombies? Number 362 knows how great Sector V is, especially number one, which is why this makes no sense and angers me. There's also 363 himself, who's really really annoying and dislikable. I know you're supposed to hate him, but he isn't entertaining or funny. He's just a giant piece of shit, and I wanted to punch my monitor whenever I saw him. <laughs> So after number one wins the scavenger hunt, number 74 brings him somewhere secret. He reveals that number one has been chosen to be a part of the galactic K&D where he'll help kids all around the universe. However, there's one problem, which is that he'll never come to Earth again. So because of that, he gets to say goodbye to his parents who are recommissioned somehow. I'm not going to complain about this because one, it's cool to see number zero again, and two, I can buy that the galactic K&D has technology that can temporarily recommission 
someone. Number one also says goodbye to all his friends. And yeah, it's amazing and extremely emotional. It's without a doubt one of the strongest scenes in the show. Now, while I love this scene, it's sadly ruined by the whole Galactic K&D reveal as well as the ending itself. The Galactic K&D pretty much come out of nowhere. I know there was a decent amount of foreshadowing of them during season six, especially in Operation Treaty. However, in this episode, number 74 is in like two scenes and that's it. Most of the episode is about Sector B getting the cake back as well as the big scavenger hunt too. So the first 30-ish minutes have nothing to do with the Galactic K&D at all. As soon as number one wins, it transitions to the big Galactic K&D reveal, which again is really jarring. It feels like it's part of a completely different episode and is just thrown in here. The concept of the Galactic Candy is cool, but we don't see any of it here, which just makes this finale not feel like a finale. I know there was supposed to be a new sequel series called the Galactic Candy, which would have continued from here, but it sadly never happened. However, I'm not going to excuse this episode for feeling incomplete because of that. Whether you like it or not, this is the finale of KD, and as a finale, it sucks. It doesn't feel conclusive, it feels like we're missing a whole extra season. This isn't satisfying in the slightest. There's no conclusion, number one just leaves his friends and family, and that's it. But you know what? It gets even worse. We fade back to another live action segment where it's revealed that father was interviewing Sector V the whole time. Connection terminated. And then, finally after that, number five gets a call from number one saying this. We told him everything he wanted to do. We'll meet you up on the moon base, okay? Oh, and number one, welcome back. That's it? What the actual fuck is this ending? This is like if the original Dragon Ball ended not with Goku winning against Piccolo, but instead after a few episodes into Z. Goku is dead and we get a cliffhanger of the Saiyans coming to Earth. Except right after that, it fades to Piccolo in the future, saying, Hey guys, remember those Saiyans that were going to kill us? Well, we stopped them. Goku came back to life and it sure was cool. That fucking sucks and that's exactly exactly what this ending feels like. It's completely unsatisfying and it ruins the entire episode which sucks since there are things to like in it. I want to like this finale and enjoy it, but there's just too many huge problems with it. I am transgender. Caramel. I'm pretty sure this is easily considered to be one of the worst K&D episodes. It's the last episode in the Heinrich saga and it's very disappointing. Most of the episode isn't that bad, it's just one part that completely ruins it. So throughout the span of multiple episodes, number 5 has been with Heinrich who's portrayed as this evil villain. He's always been a douchebag, yet number 5 shows that she still cares for him since they used to be friends. And in this episode, it's revealed why Heinrich is a giant asshole. Apparently, 5 years ago he- Excuse me, it's ma'am! It is man! I mean, she ate a bunch of caramels, which turned her into a boy. However, she didn't eat all of them, and number five saved the last of them, which can turn her back into a girl if she just shares it. So that's what she does, and now Heinrich is back to being Henrietta, and no, not that one. Okay, this doesn't make any sense at all, and feels like the writers wrote this out of their ass. There were no hints at all for Heinrich being a girl, so this literally comes out out of nowhere. Also, why did number five keep the caramel the entire time without trying to give it back to her? There have been four episodes before this where she could have given it back. She had plenty of opportunities to save her, which she didn't do because obviously the writers didn't think of this yet. This whole episode just feels like an ass pole. I would have preferred if the Heinrich saga never ended instead of getting this poo poo ending. I can see if people hate this episode, but I was never a huge fan of Heinrich or mainly the saga as a whole. So this episode didn't make me want to rip Mr. Warburton's nuts off or anything like that. There's also Sector V losing their most prized qualities, which is sort of weird. Numbers 2 and 3 were funny, but numbers 1 and 4 just bad. Number 1 loses his leadership, and number 4 loses his fury, but they both just act and look like cowards. They're literally the same character here, which is stupid, because they're clearly different from each other. Also, the whole losing their most valuable traits and being complete opposites sort of feels like a poor rehash of Operation Pool. But yeah, this is a really shitty way to end off the Heinrich saga. Nobody expects 
that's the Spanish Inquisition. Spinach. So in a vacuum, this episode really isn't that bad, but there's one big problem. This is a season six episode, and by now we've had three food villains, which are Robin Food, the Chi Shogun, and Grandma Stuffums. Basically, the whole food concept feels redundant by this point. Yes, the Spinach Inquisition are a bit different than Grandma Stuffums, but they're still pretty similar. They're people who are forcing kids to eat food they don't want to eat. None of the Spinach Inquisition are memorable or funny either. The only thing I liked was the song, which is kind of catchy. First I fucked my sister, then I fucked my mom. Castle. This episode brings back King Sandy, who's one of the weakest villains in the series. He was decent in Operation Beach, but here he's just kind of annoying and overstays his welcome. He wants to marry number three, which was funny before, but here it doesn't land since it's just the same joke again. This is especially so since this episode is not even a full season after Beach, so it's not like this was an idea that was reused or brought back multiple years later. He does fall for number three sister Mushi, which is fun. And I guess this is also a good place to talk about Mushi, who was easily one of my least favorite characters in the show. She's annoying, her voice is irritating, and I don't like her. She's one of the biggest reasons why I don't like this episode. Besides her, there's also number three using the emergency K&D line to call everyone just so they can go on a rainbow monkey ride. This is really annoying, and even for number three, this feels out of character. Finally, why are Sandy and his cousins even here at a rainbow monkey amusement park. They're all dudes, so why are they here in the first place? Maybe Sandy has a sister or something? I don't know. I don't hate this episode or find it boring, but there's a ton wrong with it. At least there are some really good jokes. Man, that Sandy's got a weird taste in girls. Uh oh. Ow! Ow! What'd you hit me for? Nothing. Where did you learn to fly? The Fly. I know for certain that this is very controversial. I know some people love this episode, but I'm not one of them. Even as a kid, I never seemed to care for this one. This is the first art episode, and in it, there's no dialogue except for background music. It's very unique, but that doesn't mean I have to like it. The episode shows how everyone deals with situations differently, but still, it's just boring since there really isn't a plot. Now, I'm not saying episodes that are light on plot are bad, because obviously that's not true. Breaking Bad has its own fly episode, which is good, even though it's still one of the series' weakest episodes. Also, I'm not saying no dialogue equals bad, because that's also not true. In Operation Hamster, there's barely any dialogue since it's a Tom and Jerry parody, and that is a fun episode. <laughs> but this just feels like a showcase for what the team could write. Yes, you did make an episode with no dialogue, which is impressive, but the episode itself is just boring. Well, that was the 4 out of 10, so now it's time to move on to the 5 out of 10s. These episodes are either mediocre or are ones that I mixed on since I have too many problems with them to overall enjoy them. Oh, it's a single piece of paper that says message. I'm not a big number 2 or western fan, so that's mainly why I didn't care for this one. The series already did two western episodes by this point, Robbers, which was pretty solid, and Nugget, which was okay. So when I saw this, I was like, really? another one. It's kind of boring. I didn't care for any of the kindergartners. Plus, I'm not a big fan of the sex cum gang either. There are some small things I like though. The tribe leader uses crayons as feathers, axes are made with pizza, and number two's locket has his grandmother in it with her saying, SHUT UP! Also, the twist ending is pretty funny too, but that's about it. I don't want to play with you anymore. Home. The first 30 seconds are amazing, but that's really all this episode has going for it. After that, Sector V is on a mission and number three's first rainbow monkey breaks, which is really stupid. Now, I don't have too much of a problem with their first rainbow monkey breaking. I think the idea itself is interesting, even if we've never seen this rainbow monkey before. It would have helped if they'd at least shown it off in a couple episodes before this. However, why is she bringing it on a mission? She's never done this before, so this seems really forced, dumb, and even 
even add a character for her. The thing that irritates me is that all they had to do was make it break at the treehouse or at her house or somewhere else realistic. Besides that, Nurse Claiborne is back, which I'm mixed on and also disappointed with. I liked her in Pink Eye, but she was definitely one of the series' weaker villains. I still wanted to see her return since Pink Eye ended with her escaping without being caught. But the problem with her return here is that she's only up against numbers 3 and 5, which is really dumb. Why would they decide to bring her back here instead of another episode with number 2 in it? Pink Eye centered around him revealing that she was evil, so wouldn't it make sense for him to capture her in a following episode? <laughs> Medic! But yeah, this episode has its problems, it's disappointing, but I don't think it's that bad. It's just mediocre. Maybe it's the way you're dressed. Bridge. This episode just feels like a concept that's already been done before, except done slightly differently. It feels too similar to Operations Closet and even not. So in this episode, Sector V and number 20,000 team up to get rid of a bridge in a mall that sells dorky clothes. If they don't get rid of the clothes, then all their parents will buy them. Later, number 5 to discovers that there's a whole different world in the store that's made of clothes. There's even belts that act like snakes, which is just the same as the ties from Knot. In that same episode, parents were going to make their kids wear ties in schools. In Operation Closet, Billy gets lost in his closet, which is a giant world made of clothes. He also doesn't want to wear one of the clothes that his mom bought for him. So yeah, I think you get why this episode feels redundant and is just a rehash of two other and much better episodes. Also, I lost count, but the show has already done the whole what if there was a giant world in this one place plenty of times now? The idea has gotten old, but at least a lot of the worlds the series made were interesting. For example, there's Operation Couch, where inside the couch is a world that's like ancient Greek. There's Operation Ducky, where the bathtub is a giant sea of soap and water. So even though the idea is reused, at least the worlds themselves were interesting. However, here it's not. Again, it just looks and feels like a worse version of Closet's world. I also didn't find the dorky clothes joke fun. Like I get it, they look stupid while wearing the clothes, but I didn't like it. Not fun. The only thing keeping this at a 5 instead of a 4 is number 20,000. I loved him in Operation Outbreak, and here, he's great too. He's over the top, he yells a lot, and I love the way he talks. My squid operatives and I have arrived at rendezvous point! Yeah, he definitely hard carries this episode. Also, Sector V giving everyone their clothes so that they'd escape was clever too. That's Mama Luigi to you, Mario! Camp. Numbers 2 and 3 take care of a stupid baby skunk for some reason. They act like parents which admittedly is entertaining at times, but it can also be annoying too. Number one yells at them for taking care of it and bringing it on a mission, which does make sense. They're going on a mission to save kids. They're not there to take care of some stupid fucking animal. And I would have gotten away with it too if it hadn't been for you meddling skunks. This episode also introduces Chester, who's another one of the weaker villains. He has some pretty good episodes, but as a character, he's just alright and kind of forgettable. Even though I don't like this episode, I am being a bit nicer on it since it is only a season 1 episode. The show is still seeing what works and what doesn't, so I'm willing to cut it some slack. Kenny and the Chimp. I was debating whether or not to put this on the list, but I decided to include it. Technically, it's not a K&D episode since it's just a field pilot. However, it does air alongside the first two episodes, Kate and No P in the Ool. So either way, I think it deserves to be included, as weird as it may be. Anyway, as a pilot, it's whatever. Not good, not bad, just forgettable. <laughs> Professor Triple XL is fun, but Kenny and his chimp are just meh. At least he was able to make his way into KND, so that's cool. One thing that's really weird is that there's a joke about swine flu, even though this came out in 1998. And swine flu wasn't a thing until 2009, so... Uh... <laughs> Anyway, I can see why this didn't get picked up. It's not a bad pilot, but it doesn't seem like it'd be strong enough as a full standalone series. Then again, who knows? Maybe with some reworking and better writing, it could have been decent. Yeah. Chicken? Cake 3. Excluding Operation Interviews, this is the worst cake episode. It kind of feels like camp again, although slightly better and less annoying. Most of it is sort of meh. The last act is decent and the fight is fun too. All the baby chickens form a giant chicken suit, plus this joke is great. Check it out, number one's a chick magnet. 
but the best part has to be when the birds shit on the cake, the delightful children eat it, and everyone watches it too. That's disgusting, but it's funny because I have a sick sense of humor. I want to like this episode, but it's sort of difficult too. My main issue was that tonally, it's so different from Cake 2. This episode focuses a lot on comedy, which isn't a bad thing since I do think the jokes work. However, it's such a disappointment and downgrade to go from Cake 2 to this. If this and Cake 2 were switched, then I'd most likely enjoy this episode. I know that might be a dumb complaint, but again, I'm not rating these episodes in a vacuum. Big, big jungle. Rabbit. This is another episode that's most likely going to be a controversial placement. This episode has both numbers 2 and 5 who are easily my two least favorite Sector V characters. It is neat to see them work together and all, but again, they aren't my favorites. I don't get why Heinrich is a number 5 school of all places. Is it because of the chocolate lava in the jungle gym? Is it to get revenge on number 5, or is it both? If it's not about revenge, then it's just really convenient that the one school he just so happens to go to is the same one that number 5 goes to. In Operation Jewels, I got the vibe that Heinrich was someone who traveled around the world looking for candy. So again, because of that, him coming here of all places seems very coincidental. Also, when Heinrich lowers the cage into the chocolate lava, the bunny turns to chocolate, but the iron bars don't for some reason. The action scene is alright, I guess, but it drags on a bit. I know I'm being harsh on this episode, but I didn't really care for it, and it was sort of boring at times. At best, it's just okay. I can see if people like it, but I didn't. Well, those were the 5 out of 10s, so now it's time to move on to the 6 out of 10s. Everything from here are episodes that I overall liked, which is pretty impressive. I did the math and that means 90% of the show is at the very least decent. And as for these next episodes, they're okay. I wouldn't watch them again, but they're worth at least one watch. Soccer is against God. Matador. Number four is a bullfighter, except instead of bulls, he's messing with adults. It's a fun idea, even if the beginning is sort of slow. I get what they were going for with this episode. Number four is the meanest Sector V character, so let's have him realize that what he's actually doing is wrong and shitty. All the adults he's fighting are just normal, except they've been drinking too much caffeine, which is pretty funny. To be fair, it does work. It's just nothing special. It's just predictable, although I could see this being much worse. Also, the soccer mom at the end is funny as well. She works as a quick minute gag, and I'm glad that she didn't get a full episode centered around her. Nugget, biscuit, nugget, in a biscuit. nugget. I already said this before, but I'm not a big Western fan, so seeing another one wasn't too exciting. That being said, even though this isn't as good as Robbers, it's still okay. It's a weird episode where everyone wants to eat chicken nuggets. Now, chicken nuggets may be my favorite food and all, but still, I'm not a huge fan of this one. It's it's a number 4 episode, which does help since he is my favorite character. The delightful children wear a giant ass belt, which is funny, and there's even a song too. Give us your so we see we got some cake today. You ready for some cake? Cake. Technically, this is the first episode besides the pilot, and as the very first episode, it's very, very okay. Besides the pilot, this is the only other 7 minute long episode, so it's short and there's not much to say about it. It doesn't do a great job introducing and showcasing the characters. For example, the delightful children are much quieter and not as evil here. It's night and day when you compare them to other episodes, especially in the later seasons. Number 2 also does nothing here, but I kinda like that. Laura is fun, and I like that she supposedly kills them when the episode ends. But yeah, it's really simple and short. Not bad, but far from great. I'm being nice on it since it is the very first episode, and again, it's only 7 minutes. It's It's cool, no pun intended, to see Professor Triple XL again from the Kenny pilot. I'm going to assume that number 30 degrees is Kenny, especially since it's also Tom Kenny voicing him. My main issue with it is number 30 degrees. He's an asshole, but he's not a funny asshole. He's just annoying and dislikable, so it's hard to like any scene with him in it. As always, there's at least a couple good jokes. The new torpedo was good, and the ending is great too. It turns out that the professor wasn't evil, but it was actually the other guy 
by Bob across the hill. The episode ends with him laughing because he's about to get rid of snow so kids won't have a snow day again. That's a weird way to end the episode, but I like it. Hank Schrader here with a roast of EDP 445. Crime. I like how the episode tricks you into thinking it'll be another number two detective episode, but then it turns out that number three gets to solve a case this time, which is cool. Throughout the episode, there's this one joke where number three is trying to color a map of the country and she's always wondering what colors to use. It was sort of funny the first and maybe even second time, but after that it just got old and was really annoying. Literally the entire episode is filled with this one joke and I really don't like it. Now despite that one big annoyance, there is one thing that saves and hard carries this episode, which is the Crayon Boy. He's amazing, since he's voiced by the legend himself, Richard Horvitz, who's mainly known for voicing Zim and Billy. His acting is fantastic, and I love every second of it. I mean, just listen to this. Then I'll be the first one in line for lunch. Also, the ending is great too. The reason he decided to give everyone detention was because he wanted to cut in line at lunch. I don't know how he's able to give other students detention, but then again, the delightful children were able to in elections, so yeah. Anyway, he gets fucked and they serve him shit on a stick instead. You guys got a universal remote control back here? Couch. This is another weird episode where numbers three and four lose a remote inside their couch. Apparently, there's a huge world inside their couch are actually everyone's couches, which is interesting to say the least. It all feels and looks like Greek and everyone has the same name too. And this is Dave. Hey. And Dave. Yo! And that's John C. <laughs> Also, the best joke has to be everyone getting upset when number three gets a remote just because she's a girl. Recess bus, recess bus. Recess. Another weird episode where the school's principal makes kids work during recess to mine for salad oil. Both of the principals are pretty forgettable, but that's because this is the only episode they're in besides briefly an operation message. I like how Lizzie saves the day because she starts crying and her boogers drop into one of the salads. Oh yeah, and this is great too. This salad dressing tastes like cum. The ending is a bit too similar to snowing, but that's just a nitpick. I want to dress up like a clown and have sex with children and kill them. Clown. A bunch of clowns want to stop number two from telling shitty jokes, and I don't blame them. I like his bad jokes in every other episode, but after listening to them for multiple minutes, it just gets kind of annoying. The montage of him getting fucked over is fun, even if it is a bit slow. We also find out that number five's father used to be a clown, which sort of makes sense since he is one of, if not the funniest character in the show. The episode also ends with the mafia clown boss dying. <laughs> Turnip. Another weird episode, but not in a great way. A farmer grows a giant turnip and... Uh, that's about it. There are some great jokes in here, such as number three calling the farmer her grandpa. Hippie Hop gets destroyed almost immediately after showing up, and number one saves the day just by kicking the stump of the turnip. But besides that, it's just very weird. It's not bad. It's not great. It's just all right. Also, fun fact, this episode is on one of the Cartoon Network collection games released on the GBA. And guess what? I have it, and I've had it ever since I was a kid. So if I ever want to watch this one episode of the show when piss poor quality running at 10 frames a second with shit audio, then I can. Space. This is the first episode that introduced Mushi, and like I said before, I really don't like her. She isn't that bad here, but her voice is still pretty annoying. She definitely holds the episode back from being good or even pretty good. Everything with Kree and number 5 is really good, and numbers 2 and 4 being scared of aliens was fun too. DreamWorks, the boss baby. Cable TV. So there's a baby. I am not a baby. I mean, there's a dude who looks like a baby who runs a cable network. He's a very weird one-off villain, but he's decent, I guess. I don't get why his parents didn't just beat the shit out of him. I mean, if he's acting like a douchebag, then run him over with your car or something. Don't let him be an asshole for his whole life. Also, this episode is surprisingly important since the delightful children take his cigar ray and use it on number one in the season finale. <laughs> 
Tommy. This is another typical villain introductory episode. The reason it's ranked lower than most of the others is because there are so many other simple episodes like this in season one. So by the time I got to this, I was sort of tired and wanted to see something different. This isn't a generic episode or anything like that. I like seeing Tommy be tricked into helping the common cold, which was different. However, while that is neat, the common cold isn't a great villain. He's okay, but there are a lot more memorable villains in the show. Also, seeing him lose to a giant chicken soup laser is poggers. You have Lice. Yet another weird but also distinct episode where Sector V fights against giant lice monsters. This is a very dumb complaint, but my main problem with it is that I just felt like watching the Invader Zim lice episode instead. That's a great episode, and this one is just alright. It's also weird that this came out not even a full year after the Invader Zim episode 2. Anyway, the third act is pretty good, but everything else is just okay. Jeez to meet you. Wait, 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 how about this one? Cheese! Number six. Six. Another cake episode, and it's okay. It's cool to see Mr. Fizz again. He's one of the more underrated villains. The chase scene is alright, and for some reason, Bradley, the stupid skunk, is in it too. I never cared for him, and I didn't care when number three thought he was dead either. The best part is hands down the ending. It's pretty shocking, and I can't believe I didn't figure out it was a cake episode based on the episode's title. This is also the first and only time where the delightful children act actually get away with the cake. It's a surprisingly somber way to end the episode. Like, they just lose, and that's it. But I like it. That wasn't flying! That was falling with style! Dogfight. I already said this, but number two is my least favorite Sector V character. He has some great episodes, but this isn't one of them. I like the idea of him having a rival that's better than him, and I like seeing them team up in the end too. My main problem is that not much happens until the third act where they stop Mr. Washer, who's a fun one-off villain. He gets so annoyed at kids making his countertops dirty that he decides to destroy an entire chili dog factory. But yeah, the last act is pretty fun, but again, the rest of the episode is just okay. I can see if people love this, but this wasn't one of my favorites. <laughs> Well, those were the 6 out of 10, so now it's time to move on to the 7 out of 10s. These next episodes are good. Not great, but definitely a step up from the previous episodes. Hi, I'm Paul. Feral. I know I've gone over some weird episodes already, but this is easily one of the weirdest episodes in the show. <laughs> Number 1 gets brain damage and thinks he's a rainbow monkey. The pacing is sort of all over the place too. It's kind of slow for most of the episode, but then in the last minute he said turns back to normal. And the only reason he turns back is because of how stupid the mission was. The secret tablet they were after had a code that would help them win a rainbow monkey keychain. Fountain. Come. Here we have the first two-parter, which is easily the weakest, but still mostly good. It starts in the bathroom with some girl named Leona and the delightful children, which makes me wonder. Hey, um, how do you guys, like, do that anyway? Never mind, the show said it for me. Anyway, this is the first episode that takes place at school, which is cool. There's a short sequence where everyone is sneaking out of class to go on a mission, which is fun too. Once the mission starts, it mainly feels like a worse version of Operation Flavor. Sector V explores the underground cafeteria, which is very Indiana Jones inspired, and again, it just feels like Operation Flavor. We find out that the delightful children somehow made number one bald, which is why he hates them so so much. After that, there's a fountain of youth which has been keeping Leona young forever, which is really interesting. However, Leona sprays Sector V and the delightful children with the water, so they turn into babies. So that means for the second half of the episode, we get to see dumb babies, which is a bit annoying. Rule number five of television, don't include stupid babies in your shows unless you're Rugrats. Even though I don't like Leona, it is unique to have another kid antagonist. After the fountain gets destroyed, Sector V says goodbye to Leona. She grows old and will soon die. Bike! Except she doesn't, which is really stupid. All they had to do was hint at her dying and this ending would have been great. But no, she was an asshole to everyone and she gets to stay immortal because... 
fuck you. If it wasn't for this ending being annoying, this would be ranked notably higher. This lab thinks that I am cool. Uncool. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. Not at all. Please, please not at all. This feels like a slightly better version of Operation Lace. It's a horror episode where Sector V tries to rescue another KND member. Except not really, since it turns out it was just a card, which is both funny and also a great twist. Also, there's a balloon of Dexter for no reason. Point. This is one of the best episodes that reminds you that Sector V as well as others are still just a bunch of dumb kids. They think teenagers are going somewhere to turn into adults which is over the top and stupid. I like the part where they all get freaked out when looking inside the car. You'd think some teenagers were eating cupcakes with EDP but no, the car is just DISGUSTING! I also like how it ends with everyone skating at their treehouse since they ruined the entire skating rink with cheese. TASTE THE RAINBOW MOTHERFUCKER! Rainbows. Number three helps some asshole catch rainbow monkeys, but then they all kill him. <laughs> I find it hard to believe that they've been on the island before, yet they've never seen one rainbow monkey. I guess they'd all just turn invisible, but still, I'm not buying it. Also, seeing all the rainbow monkeys constantly changing colors is weird because it hurts my eyes. My eyes! Saturn. Another rainbow monkey episode where Sector V goes into space and number three meets the first rainbow monkey sent to space. The first half is just okay, but once Ramon is on screen, it gets a lot better. The reason Ramon looks so ugly is because his scientists rushed him because they wanted to send him into space before the Russians did. That's great, and his entire backstory in general is over the top and stupid. It's even better since it's told in a dumb robotic voice. Also, the CG rainbow monkeys are pretty distracting. Like, I get it, there's a shit ton of them on screen so it's easier to reuse a bunch of models instead of drawing every single one of them. My problem is that it switches back and forth from 2D to 3D. Just pick one style and stick with it, otherwise it's jarring and distracting. Finally, we find out that number one secretly likes rainbow monkeys too, so that's epic. But yeah, the first half is okay, but the second half is great. <laughs> Your mother's a nice woman, but your grandma's a whore. Tapioca. Ah! Number two's grandmother and her senior friends are pretty funny. It's definitely a weird episode since the villains are senior citizens that use de-aging cream to turn young again. And it's even weirder that Finger Eleven let the show use one of their songs. Beautiful kitten fish. Fishy. Numbers two and four go through the treehouse so they could flush number three's dead fish. I like seeing them explore the treehouse so we get to see parts of it that we haven't seen before. There's even a giant stadium that's only there for KND members to flush their fish. So does that mean people come over like every day just to flush their stupid fish? I don't know, but anyway, it's good to see the cat lady again. I also like that instead of buying another fish at a store, they try to win one at a fair. Hey dog, you get some ice cream? Ice cream. So this is the first 11 minute episode since the pilot and caked, which were only seven minutes. It's very simple, but it's still one of the first episodes. So that does make sense. The car chase scene as well as a giant ice cream monster is cool. No pun intended. Ah! I also like how there's a heater in the factory, which is the only reason they win in the end. We're not aiming for the truck! Holiday. Even though it's obvious that number one isn't cheating on Lizzie, it's still fun. I like episodes where Lizzie needs to actually do something in order to help Sector V. I know she causes the problem because of her Bill Cosby pie, but still, it's fun seeing her fly the plane even if she wasn't aiming for the truck. <laughs> What's so great about dumb old Texas? Cowgirl. Another weird episode where an old cowgirl fights other adults. This is a concept that the show rarely did, even though it's one of the more interesting ones. I like how it ends with her and her horse chasing after Wink and Fib since they both want to fuck them. I'm going to rape you!
office. Mr. Boss wants to send all of his employees' daughters to Pluto just so they could have more time to work for him. That's so over the top and stupid, especially since he doesn't realize that he'll be losing money since he'll have to pay his employees more. Mr. Boss has always been one of the better villains, not the best, but still one of the more memorable ones. His voice is great and I love how he always sounds so annoyed and angry. Also, he doesn't have any superpowers and isn't super smart either. He's just an asshole boss and that's it, which is why I like him. Also, this was the first episode to introduce Rainbow Monkeys, so that's epic. <laughs> Wanna break from the ants? Good night, everybody. Sitter. The first couple minutes are extremely cringy, but that's good because I love cringe. I was definitely getting Watamote vibes from this. While the first half is awesome, the second half is just okay. Cree and the other teenage ninjas trap every kid in town on their beds and then send them into the ocean. But then it turns out... The second half is pretty disappointing since I wanted to see more of number two acting cringy with Kree. Also, the episode ends with him waking up from the dream just like how the episode started. So I guess this is just an infinite loop or something, which is weird to think about. Guess what, bitch? Virus. Kree tries to find number 5, but instead wastes time messing with the other Sector V members. It's a bit slow paced and also very simple, but the opening and ending scenes are both great. Sometimes I dream about cheese. The Shogun. I know I've said this plenty of times now, but there are a good handful of really weird episodes. This one has a cheese Shogun forcing people to mine cheese for him. It's so bizarre and this whole concept doesn't feel like it should be a part of the K&D universe, even though there's already a bunch of weird stuff in it. That being said, this is still fun, even though it's so different from a lot of other episodes. Also, this bit where number two tricks number four into thinking he's evil gets me every time. Time to take a piss. No pee in the ool. The pilot episode which started it all. It's drastically different, but that makes sense since again, this is the pilot. Character designs are notably different. Everyone has thick outlines and long necks, and even the voices are different too. Numbers 4 and 3's accents are barely present, and number 1 sounds like he's whispering the entire time. Besides the Billy and Mandy crossover, this is the only episode where the title isn't an acronym. Mr. Wink and Fib are the villains, and they've always been mid-tier villains, so it's weird to see than being the pilot instead of someone else. Considering it's only a 7 minute pilot, it's pretty solid. No power. My little did she know that the spooky spooky treehouse ghost was really one of the first episodes of the series, and it's good. I like how they show off how the treehouse is powered by a bunch of hamsters just to have them immediately leave and go on vacation. Grandma Stuffums is a fun villain, and I was surprised by how the episode ended. I thought number two would just scare her off since he ate all of her food, but instead the hamsters come and eat everything, which is even better. But yeah, I'd love to see Grandma Stuffums fight Nico Kado. Closet. Sector V goes into a kid named Finger, I mean Billy's closet to rescue him even though he just doesn't want to wear some stupid sweater. <laughs> He even likes it once he wears it, but in the end credits, he's a jackass and strings it in the wash. The show already used the idea of what if there was another world inside this one area this season, such as Operations Pool and Rabbit. However, I think it's done really well here. I like how this one kid has so much unwanted shit that it creates this giant endless mountain of clothes. Anyway, Billy is pretty funny, and while Tom Kenny is great as always, I think it was a missed opportunity to have him be voiced by Richard Horvitz. I guess his personal personality didn't fit the character, but it would have been a fun joke to have him voice another character named Billy on the same network. Nice car. Mission. Number 4 gathers a handful of villains just so they could bowl and beat his dad. It's a fun and unique premise, although I don't buy number 4 doing this. I know he can be an asshole and all, but I don't think he'd go against orders and break out villains just so he doesn't have to polish his dad's trophy. I could see him asking Sector V to help him out for a reason this dumb, but I guess they wouldn't be able to since it's an adult only tournament, I think. <laughs> Anyway, this one problem is annoying, but I was still able to have a good amount of fun with it. Yeah! 
Yes! But to delightful children, blackmail number one into quitting the team because they have a picture of his ass. It's extremely dumb and I love the concept, although there is one big problem. No pun intended. Ah! Number one choosing to quit the team seems very out of character for him. He spends so much time in the K&D and helping others, so it's really stupid for him to quit just because he doesn't want anyone seeing his butt. Maybe if he quit because someone else on the team was getting blackmailed, like number two for example, then it would be more realistic. Or maybe number two decides to quit instead. I don't know. He's If it wasn't for this one major problem, this would easily be an 8 or probably 9 out of 10 episode. Again, it's so dumb and there's literally a minute spent on Sector V making fun of number one's ass. The ending is also perfect too, since they show a picture of his ass. They didn't need to do that, but they did. And it's great. Ass! <laughs> Chad. It's always cool to see more K&D operatives besides Sector V. Chad is a fun character, although it's disappointing that he's in barely any episodes before he becomes a teenager. The villains are fun, although it's sorta of dumb how they wipe out every single K&D member. They're built up as these super strong villains, which is weird considering they never make another appearance in the show again. I guess now that Chad isn't part of the K&D, they don't care. It's just very bizarre that these one-off villains manage to nearly destroy the entire Entire K and D. The only other villain who managed to do this was Grandfather, which is funny to think about. Also, how the hell does Chad not realize that the villains are his own parents? They look and sound identical, so this makes no sense. He's supposed to be smart, so again, this is just really stupid. At least him stopping them by quitting all his programs was funny. Rocky Roll McDonald's. Fast food. This is easily one of the show's darkest episodes. Chester is selling burgers with children and them to sharks so they can be eaten. Let me repeat, he is selling children so that they can be eaten and die. What the fuck? Also, yes, there are shark people in the candy universe because it be how it do. The chase scene drags on for a bit, but it was surprising to find out that number three was never in the bun in the first place. Not amazing or anything, but definitely a lot better than Chester's first episode. Also, at the end, a bunch of sharks and cars are surrounding Chester and his restaurant. Chester is scared of them, even though he shouldn't. They all have water in their cars, and if they get out of their cars, then the water will spill out and they'll be dehydrated. They'll all just be flopping around on the ground and won't be able to harm him. In Operation Utopia, the episode ends with Chester wearing his dream headband, however he realizes that he's wearing it. So that means he should just be able to take it off, right? With this, I can only come to the conclusion that Chester is a fucking idiot. What are you fucking retarded? It's a lie! It's gay. Spankenstein. This is a very weird episode. Not because there's a giant Frankenstein rainbow monkey monster, but because of how the episode is structured. Mushi captures Spankula, number two goes out to a store to get chocolate, and then the giant rainbow monkey monster comes. But then, two minutes later, he dies, number two goes back, Spankula spanks Mushi, and that's it. It feels like not much actually happened in the episode, or at least all the stuff that happened doesn't feel connected or cohesive. Cohesive. Like, there's a giant rainbow monkey monster, but it barely does anything, so what's the point? That being said, there is a lot to like in this episode. Spankula is one of the stronger villains, Mushi is a straight up villain now, which is nice, and number three's father is hilarious. It's weird that Sandy comes back at the end to help Mushi escape since this is his last appearance in the show. I guess the writers realize that a Mushi and Sandy episode isn't a great idea. I guess you're gonna miss the panty. Raid. Brief. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like number two. But I'm right here, guys. I'm not a big fan of inanimate objects coming to life as well as animals talking, but I do like a talking underwear assassin. The B-plot of everyone trying to get number 65.3's message works so well since it was about the underwear assassin the entire time. But yeah, number one fighting a pair of underwear for nearly a full episode is pretty fun. Let's go to the beach, eat. Beach. Sector V is at the beach. Meanwhile, number one is on suicide watch since there's currently no missions for him. Sandy is okay in this episode, he works as a one-off villain, but as I said before, I did not want to see more of him. Also, number four is a big soon soon. We're being chased by ghosts! Ghost. 
Here's another one of the show's darkest episodes where number three has to deal with the death of one of the hamsters. A bunch of dead hamsters come and drag her down into the afterlife and they even try to keep her there forever. I don't get why the hamsters are evil. They like number three, but why do they go so far as to keep her from going back to the living world? Are they just assholes? Who knows? Life was like a box of chocolates. Chocolate. Definitely better than Operation Rabbit, although still not the best Heinrich episode. It was cool to see him take out all of Sector V by himself. That definitely raised the stakes, or should I say chocolate? <laughs> Bruh. I like how Heinrich loved his chocolate powers, but then hated it just because he wanted to eat a cheeseburger. I don't get how he survives the sun. He melts into a puddle, so shouldn't he be, you know, dead? Also, how was Heinrich kept in the Arctic prison? Wouldn't his parents be looking for him? Then again, he's been exploring the world on his own for years, so maybe he doesn't have parents, or maybe they don't give a shit about him. Piano. A very simple episode where Sector V tries to get rid of a bunch of pianos from a truck. Number 4 is a fucking moron but somehow doesn't die after being crushed by hundreds of pianos. And then at the end, everyone else nearly dies too. Bye bye. Canyon. The Torlinator tries to, or actually does stop the KND from making and eating Rainbow Monkey cereal in the Grand Canyon. It's a slapstick heavy episode which works although other episodes did this better. I don't understand how he manages to flush all of the cereal out of the canyon. Is there a hole big enough to flush it all down? It doesn't look like there is, but who knows. Who built the cages, let's, Joe? Let's talk about who built the cages, about. Joe. Let's talk zoo. Sector V and the delightful children get locked up in a zoo along with other kids. Most of the episode is just good, but seeing Sector V and the delightful children and work together is great. We rarely see them or other villains work with the KND, so this is pretty cool. Also, the villain dies by getting run over by all the kids. KO! Uh, meow? Cats. Hello, Mr. Huggykins. It's so good to see you. I hate me. The first half is pretty funny, but the second half is notably worse. It's still good, but it's a lot more fun seeing number four break number three's toy cat and then dressing <laughs> up as it. This episode introduces the cat lady, who's an alright villain, but clearly not one of the best. You know what I love about my kitties? They always come back. I always come back. And because it's a villain introductory episode, it's pretty simple. There's a chase scene which is okay, and the cat lady's monster form is cool too. Skateboards rock, shoes like feetsies, you are watching Planet Shinzy. Planet. Numbers 4 and 3 are on a planet filled with talking rainbow monkeys, however it turns out that it's just an amusement park. It's a pretty good twist since this episode is told through number 4's perspective, and he is a fucking idiot after all. The ending where number 4 tells number 3 that a pop corn kettle was stuck in her teeth the entire time is also great too. Oh! Safety. A bunch of liberal safety robots try to make the world go woke. It's weird, over the top, but not nearly as great or funny as others like Operation Mini Golf. The senator is pretty funny and memorable, but besides that, this is still one of the weakest two-parters. <laughs> college. Professor Triple XL tricks number one into breaking into his college just to taste the snow cone. I love the concept, but in execution, it's just good. The first half is great, but similarly to cats, the second half is notably worse. It's another chase scene, and it is good, especially since number one doesn't want to be rescued. However, it drags on for a bit, and it was more fun seeing number one eating snow cones for multiple hours. <laughs> Tricycle. Tommy gets a gay little bike that ends up destroying nearly every single bike in town. There's multiple chase scenes and they're all pretty good, especially the one with number two and Tommy. Chad is in it for a bit, which is always good. I like that they break his car even though he was just delivering pizza. Then again, it doesn't really make any sense. If he was just delivering pizza, then why wasn't he driving a pizza van? Anyway, Tommy's bike transforms into this giant tricycle, which is dumb, but cool. I know the show has 
has done inanimate objects coming to life multiple times now, but I'm fine with this. The bike doesn't talk, even though the sweater and operation closet didn't either. Also, there's this really annoying joke where number three thinks everyone is throwing her a surprise party. It was sort of funny the first time, but then it gets used like another three times and it gets old real fast. It's even used in the end credits, which would have been funny, but again, it's just annoying at this point. I'm going to break you. What? Ah! Like a Kit Kat bar. Jules. This candy tastes like... The very first Heinrich episode, and clearly one of the best. I like Heinrich, he's a fun villain, although like I said, I wasn't as invested in him like others were. He works well here, his accent is funny, and he turns into a giant candy monster, which is cool. THE ONE PIECE IS REAL! Pirate, another simple introductory villain episode. It's one of the better ones since Sticky Beard is one of the best villains in the show. Mark Hamill is great as him, his design is great, and I love how he's a villain, yet he still decides to help the K and D at times. I also like that his ship goes around the entire town destroying everything in sight. But yeah, it's good, but there's not too much to it since it's pretty simple and straightforward. Fire! Pink Eye. I'm a bit mixed on this episode since there's things that are great and others that aren't so great. The dim lighting is unique and helps this episode stand out from others, especially before ones like Operation Crime came out. This is the first detective episode, so again, it's an original concept. It's also a very memorable episode since it's about a nurse that makes apple crumbles with kids eye crust. <laughs> Now, while all of that is great, I do have my issues with it. The story is a bit too short and simple, so it really isn't much of a mystery. Nurse Claiborne is one of the weaker villains, but then again, she's only in two episodes. Something really dumb is that Claiborne aims her weapon at number two, even though shooting him wouldn't have much effect on him. His whole body would turn to crust, but there wouldn't be any crust in his eyes since he wears goggles. Also, Claiborne gets away, which always made this ending feel weird and bittersweet. I really like it, although her next appearance was a big disappointment. Tom and Jerry don't talk. Hamster. This takes place at the same time as the previous episode, Recess, which is unique. Most of it has no dialogue, so it sort of feels like Operation Fly, but done right. The concept is notably different, and clearly a Tom and Jerry parody, which works well. Bill the science guy. Science. This is the last art episode, and while it's not as experimental as others like Food Fight or Fly, it's still solid. Every sector shows off their new inventions, and a lot of it is cool and fun. I I'm kind of surprised that it took the show this long to do something like this. While the inventions and commercials are fun, number two does hold us back from being an even better episode. He wants to show off his new booger invention to the judges, but it just comes off as annoying and unfunny. Hey, that's pretty good. Also, number 13 is in it, so that's good. That kick kicks in and cool cat's face. Release the brainstorm to make the motherfucking brain warm. Robbers. This might be a bit of a hot take since I'm pretty sure a lot of people really like this episode, but I think it's just solid. It's fun and easily the best western episode, but there's one really dumb nitpick I have with it. Why is the school bus like a train? Yes, I know it's because this is a western episode, but still, it doesn't make sense. The school bus is run by non-K&D members, it's driven by a regular bus driver. And no, this isn't how every school bus in the show looks either, because we clearly see regular regular school buses and Operation President. I know you have to accept and ignore a lot of stuff to enjoy the show, but this just doesn't make sense. Yes, it's only like this because they wanted to have a train episode, but again, why is a regular adult driving a KND like vehicle? It's not a big problem or anything, it just bothers me because mostly everything else in the show I can believe to a certain extent. But besides that one problem, this is still fun, especially the ending. In the beginning, God created naked children. Archive, another art episode where we see the origins of how adults were made. While it is cool, I have some issues. My main problem is that it contradicts some of Operation Zero, even though it was made a few years before it. Father was a man made by kids and is already an adult, so he's not grandfather's son, I guess? I don't know, and I'm only bothered by this because I love Operation
Operation Zero so much. Maybe this is just how number one thinks adults are made and isn't actually canon or true. But then again, the teacher at the end says they know, so I guess this is supposed to be canon? Who fucking knows? Anyway, the entire episode turns out to be a report from number one, which is way too similar to the last art episode report. It's still a bit different since it's a report for school and it's only being told by one person. But again, it definitely gives off Operation Report vibes. While I do get a lot of enjoyment from this episode, my headcanon is that this is just a joke episode. Not only does it clash with the lore in Operation Zero, but it also means that every single adult would know about the KND. That would create huge problems in the show's lore, and I don't want to think about that. The children could march right into Cleveland and take the toys from the cranky. Well, those were the 7 out of 10s, so now it's time to move on to the 8 out of 10s. These next episodes are pretty damn good. Nothing amazing, but well above average. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to be. Recruit. It's cool to see the, or I guess a process of a kid being recruited into the KND. In Operation End and Training, it's revealed that you need to pass training in order to get into the KND. This doesn't matter though, because this isn't how kids get recruited. Sector V just fucks with a kid who turns out to be the twins again, which is a good twist. There's some good slapstick in the second half, but Operation Trip will always be better. Better Unga-Squad! Hugs. <laughs> Number four dicks around with a giant rainbow monkey on Rainbow Monkey Island. It's not explained how he and everyone else got there, and I kind of want an explanation. He falls into a hole and then wakes up on the island. Does the hole lead all the way to the island, or did he pass out when he reached the bottom and the girls brought him there somehow? I don't know, but I'm not going to hold it against the episode too much because of how fun it is. Number four shows the rainbow monkey how to be more gorilla-like, which ends up fucking him over since he has to fight him later. And the way he stops him is by hugging him, which is great. <laughs> Hospital. Sector V goes to save a KND member in a hospital, and it turns out that it's Bradley, the stupid fucking skunk. I don't care for Bradley like at all, but at least the reveal was unexpected. I love how number one thinks adults are going to turn babies into adults. It's a great joke, but sadly it got turned into one of the worst episodes. I don't know why Bradley is in a hospital to begin with. Shouldn't he be... You know, at a vet or an animal hospital? The reveal is cool and all, but it doesn't make sense. Why are you teeth? teeth. A lot of season one episodes are pretty simple, and this one is too, but it's one I like notably more. Even though Night Brace has appeared in other episodes, this is the first and only one that solely focuses on him. Night Brace is one of the more underrated and underutilized villains. I would have liked to see more episodes that had him as a main villain, because I think there were some more stories to tell with him. As for this episode though, I was surprised that the dentist wasn't Night Brace. I thought him, Night Brace, and the candy shop guy were all the same person. The show is usually pretty over the top, and this is a good showcase for that. Number four's braces, number three's shiny teeth, and even Night Brace's backstory are all really stupid. <laughs> More macaroni. Macaroni. Number 13. Number fucking 13. Can I touch that one? No. How about this? No! I could see if some people find him annoying or unlikable, but I don't. I love him. He's great, he's funny, and I kinda wish we got to see more of him. Then again, he might have gotten the perfect amount of time since too much of him would be a bit much. My only problem is that the second half is clearly weaker. Number 13 is in it considerably less and it just feels like a regular episode where the KND fights the villains. Like a good amount of episodes, at least the ending is great. <laughs> Pop. Another villain introduction episode, and it's easily one of the better ones. Adults raise the drinking age of soda to 13, so now drinking it is illegal for kids, which is so dumb. Mr. Fizz is a really weird but also cool villain, especially his design. I love how he gets angry all the time, and the only way to relieve himself is by drinking a shit ton of soda. Also, number two holds a gun to his head at the end, so hey guys, I guess that's it. <laughs> Little Billy, this is not bad, nice. 
tricky. Not an amazing Halloween special, but still pretty damn good, especially for it only being 11 minutes. There's this new pirate called John Silver who's funny, and number four's costume is great too. Also, the transition is fucked up, and it cuts in and out to a red background for some reason. It's very jarring, it hurts my eyes, and it looks awful. I guess it's supposed to be Halloween themed or something, but it just looks bad. Yeah, bad. Right. Greedy to eat all that. You'll end up with your teeth all grey. Sprout. Number four eats a Brussels sprout accidentally, so now Sector V shrinks down and goes into his stomach to get it out. It's so stupid and over the top and it works so well. All the action scenes inside number four are really good, especially when number five swims in stomach acid, yet somehow doesn't burn to death. Anyway, this is definitely a fetish episode for some people, but not for me. And now he wants to strangle me with his diabolical hands. Spank. Yet another introductory villain episode, and this is also one of the best. Count Spankulot is definitely one of the show's best villains. He's so stupid, over the top, and I love him. He's a dude who goes around spanking children, however he only spanks naughty children. Unlike a lot of other adult villains that hate all kids, Spankulot isn't an asshole. He's only doing what he does because he wants to punish those who deserve to be punished, even if some of the reasons are stupid. This makes Spankulot both a fun but also fleshed out character since he isn't as one dimensional as other villains. A good amount of villains in the show aren't that deep and part of their charm is being very simple. However, I still like getting some more interesting villains every so often. Anyway, Spankulot ends up in court for illegally spanking a kid, which is amazing. Sector V also fucks him over in the end by having him spank the judge who sent him to prison. I don't know how they found his house, but then again, the K and D can do a lot, so yeah. Also, Sector V gets punished for fucking him over, which is good because he was just trying to be good for once. Scrub, scrub, scrub till the world is brown. Ducky. Ass! The captain is great. I love how he's been running away from his mother for over 30 years just because he doesn't want to take a bath. I know he, as well as this episode in general, is supposed to be a Star Trek parody, but I've never seen Star Trek since I'm not a raging homosexual. Anyway, Anyway, it's pretty fun, but there is one small problem. This is the fourth time this series has done the whole what if there was another world within an everyday object or place. There's Operation Couch, Closet, and even Pool. While I do think the idea is a bit redundant, uh, at least this episode is a lot of fun, so I don't hold it against the episode that much. Look at this Date. Another Lizzie episode where she thinks she's going on a date with number one at the delightful children's house. I know people seem to hate Lizzie, but at least she's somewhat useful here. She shows number one how to stop the delightful Ray and also breaks it even if she didn't mean to. I don't know where father is even though this is his house. In Operation Party, he's out to relax, but here there's no explanation. Also, it's weird that number two doesn't take his goggles off when he turns delightful. SHUT UP! Quiet. Like a lot of season 1 episodes, this one is really simple, but works very well. It's not the most original concept, but it's still a lot of fun. I like seeing returning characters like Lizzie, Toilinator, and Sticky Beard again. There's even a callback to number 4 dressing up as number 1 in Operation Cannon. But yeah, very simple, but very fun. <laughs> Lunch. Robin Food is a dumb, but memorable villain. I know Grandma Stuffums is already the show's food villain, but I think Robin Food and his crew are different enough. Instead of forcing kids to eat food, they steal them and give them the senior citizens. Also, the only reason they steal food is because they're lazy and don't want to cook themselves. It's different to see Lizzie as the main character for once and save the day, even if she already did so in Cake 2. The action scene is pretty cool, and the celery being in the lunchbox the entire time was great too. I wonder what's for dinner. Clues. There's a lot of setup for the mystery, but it's worth it, especially since everyone gets just the right amount of screen time. It really is difficult to tell who did it, and I love that Mushi did it since she's evil and is also a fucking asshole. The live action joke is amazing, and this is also the first time we see number three's parents as well as number two's mom's face. Coffee, 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 coffee. Undercover. A very memorable episode where Lenny from the Delightful Children pretends to be a spy for the K and D. It's a unique concept and all, but it's obvious that he isn't a spy 
Kai, which is my only nitpick. Besides that, Cup of Joe was a really fun one-off villain. Everything from his voice to his design is great. He also has super speed because he drinks a shit ton of coffee, which is dumb, but good. Damn, damn. Party. The delightful children invite a bunch of teenagers to their house for a party, but then they get fucked over and ask Sector V for help. I love seeing episodes where villains and the K&D team up and work together. I know the delightful children don't actually do anything, but it's still different to see Sector V help them out for once. One thing I never knew was that the upper crust is an actual band, so that's cool, I guess. I don't know why they're here, especially since they only get like a minute of screen time. You'd think if they were invited onto the show, they'd have a full episode about them, or would at least get to play a full song of theirs, but I guess not. Anyway, there's also this small nitpick that bothers me. Apparently, no one in Sector V except for Number 5 knows what deodorant is. This is a plot hole since Number 4 uses a phone made of deodorant in Operation Future. I guess you could argue that just because they use it as a 2x4 part doesn't mean they know what it is, but I still think that's a stretch. Also, we get more Maurice and Cree tries to suck his penis. Utopia. Number one dreams about being on an island with no adults. It's cool and also one of Chester's best episodes. My only problem is that I don't fully understand how number one's or the wearer's body works in the real world. Whatever action they're doing in the dream world also means they're doing it in the real world too, which makes sense. However, what happens if the wearer gets pushed around and falls over or something? Wouldn't that mean they'd fall over and the headband would come off? I'm probably thinking too too much into it, but it still somewhat bothers me. Also, I mentioned this earlier, but Chester is wearing the headband at the end, but also realizes that he's wearing it. If he knows this, couldn't he just tear the headband off himself? Like you could, G. Daddy. How about you kids? You want some pancakes? Uh, sure. Pancakes would be great. Then go to a diner! Mr. Boss has always been one of my favorite villains since he has no superpowers and is purely just an asshole boss. However, this episode is what made me enjoy him considerably more. He's not just a simple-minded jerk, but instead he's someone who genuinely loves his kids, although he still hates everyone else's. We also find out that he's a Jew since he's too stubborn and cheap to pay $4 for a haircut. Considering he's a boss of a company, he should have a decent amount of money, so this makes it even more funny. Madden, Madden, Madden. Leader. No! Number four! <laughs> Allah <Allahu> Akbar! <laughs> Another Lizzie episode where she acts as the leader of Sector V. It sort of feels like a rehash of Operation Cannon, except there are clear differences between them. Number four puts himself in charge while number one does nothing. However, here, everyone believes Lizzie is in charge, plus number one is busy on a mission. Chad is here, which is great, and his plan is fucking amazing. He has a football that can blow up the entire moon base. However, he doesn't explain how his plan works. So I like to imagine that during their football game, he just punched the football all the way to the moon base, and then it explodes, killing everyone on it. AMC theaters. We make movies better. Movie. Number four wants to see Morbius, so he sneaks in and finds out it's a meeting spot for all the villains. I always wondered where a good spot for the villains to meet up would be, but a movie theater is a perfect place. There's a ton of villains here, and it's cool to see number four fight them all. However, it is very unrealistic seeing him win against all of them. This is especially so, since it takes all of Sector V just to stop one of these villains. <laughs> Breakup, a very over-the-top episode where kids play baseball, except instead of hitting balls, they just break random shit. The fight between number four and Ernest is awesome, because again, they're just breaking everything around them. The only nitpick I have is that the montage in the beginning drags on for a bit, but besides that, it's a ton of fun. That's called cow tipping. <laughs> Bullies. The Jurassic Park episode where instead of a park for dinosaurs, it's a park for bullies. Jerry Rassic, yes, that's his actual name, is great. Both his face and voice are pretty stupid and funny. And so I've been forced to live with the agony of a permanent wedgie. 
for life. Also, the reason his face and voice are fucked up is because number four gave him a god-awful wedgie when he was in first grade. I also like that we get another kid villain or antagonist since the series doesn't have too many of them. The action scenes are pretty good and the bullies are a lot of fun too. The only nitpick is that number four and Jerry look the exact same during the flashback, even though that was three years ago. But besides that, this episode is a lot of fun. I'm a fire in my laser! Canon. Considering this is one of the very first episodes, this is pretty great. The beginning where a bunch of villains show up is slow, but that's really my only complaint. I can see if some people don't like this episode since number four could come off as dislikable or annoying, but I'm not one of them since I love number four and he's pretty funny here. He's so obsessed with becoming the team leader and having them make a stupid clam cannon. I also love that number one thinks it's a cool idea when it gets back and then everyone else immediately thinks it's cool too. Too. Also, it's weird to see the two army villains here since they're never in any other episodes besides being cameos in the background. I guess no one gave a shit about them since they're lame and kinda suck. Hey waiter! There's a hair in my cake! Cake 2. What the? Huh? This is a big step up from the first Cake episode. Everything feels so much bigger and grander. Hell, even the final act takes place in a giant stadium with a giant cake monster. Plus it ends with Lizzie saving the day by crashing herself into the cake. We were getting ready to win this election Frankly, we did win. Elections. The delightful children are now the fourth grade president, even though that shouldn't be possible since there are five of them. Anyway, I like seeing this plot continue from Operation Snowing. I guess since Slip and Jimmy is in the Arctic prison, there needs to be a new fourth grade president. The stakes are pretty high in the first half since number one is in prison, meanwhile all the other grades are fighting each other. There's this one part where number one rips bubblegum from a dude's mouth and then starts swinging from it like Spider-Man, which is really Really cool. Used to say I keep a check. She was all bad, bad, never the best. The first half is notably better just because the second half isn't as interesting. It's cool to see everyone drive on bicycles to and in a middle school, but it just lasts too long. I will say that the ending is great. Everyone wins because the principal starts yelling at Chad, and apparently this causes the whole school to fucking explode. Also, I could say something about how this episode predicted the future with the election being stolen and all, but I don't want my YouTube channel to be deleted. Again. Dude, this car kicks ass, and I can watch Madagascar while I'm driving! Safari. Number one gets hunted by Chester for an entire episode. It's entertaining and also includes some pretty good slapstick. <sighs> Even though this is still Chester, he sounds and acts notably different, which is probably why I enjoy this one so much. I've said this before, but I'm not a huge fan of Chester. But here he poses as a big threat, and he's also super buff too for some reason. Man, you just pick it up already! Flavor. There's a big ice cream temple that holds a fourth flavor of ice cream, which I don't really get. Number five explains that there are three elemental ice cream flavors, which are chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. But what about other flavors like mint, lemon, and a bunch of others? Anyway, the temple is really cool. No pun intended. <laughs> and I love that it gets destroyed because the delightful children put sprinkles on the ice cream and ruined it. What the dog doing? Dog house. Season 6 is definitely the season I remember the least, and this is one of the episodes I either never saw or barely remember watching. I didn't remember or barely saw Operation Home when I was a kid, so I always thought Nurse Claiborne just got away and was never caught. The same goes for Operation Hound, where number 5's teacher is a werewolf, and I always thought that plot never got resolved. Well, it turns out it actually did get resolved, although it did take them three whole seasons to get back to this. Anyway, unlike Operation Home, which was a disappointment, this episode is actually pretty damn good and is just about as good as Hound. This has everything I wanted in it. The plot continues, but in a new and interesting way. Number four is the main character this time, however, number five is still very important, unlike number two in Home, who isn't even in it. The concept is expensive expanded upon and we see multiple other students that are turned into were dogs. Their teacher is the main antagonist this time, which is new and also poses as a bigger threat too. Not only that, but there's also a lot of great jokes, like how the teacher turned into a were dog because her ex-husband gave her a cursed necklace. There's this one joke where number four asks the teacher when the next pop quiz is and she answers without even thinking. It's decent on its own, but then it gets used again later on and ends up being the reason why number four knows how to stop her and break the curse. And of course, there's this. Hey, number five! 
I think I figured out what year the War of 1812 was. But yeah, my only nitpick is that the first act is a bit slow, but besides that, it's a great follow-up to Operation Hound. Peanut butter on my balls, let the dog lick it. Hound. I always really liked this episode as a kid for some reason, and I guess part of that is because this might have been where I got my transformation fetish from. You what? Anyway, the show seems to use animals or people with animal abilities a good handful of the time, and they never explain how or why this is. There's just people with animal abilities, sharks that drive cars, and a bunch of other weird shit. Then again, there's also spanking vampires, as well as a dude with fire powers, so I guess it's not too far out there. Anyway, I don't get why number two is in this episode. He doesn't really do anything. I'm pretty sure the episode would be the exact same if you removed him. Training mode! Training. Remember in Operation End, where number one tells Tommy that he has to do training in Antarctica to get into the K&D? Well, it turns out that joke was actually true when we see him as well as Sonya and Lee stop father and his ice cream men. This is the first episode to introduce the code module, which is a plot thread that lasts for multiple episodes in the season. I was sort of confused as to how father was able to disguise himself as number 86, but then I realized he was wearing a bra, so that's weird. Tommy and Sonya are pretty fun, but I never really cared for Lee. <laughs> Lizzie. The very first Lizzie episode, and it's still one of her best. I've said this before, but I can see if people don't like Lizzie, especially in this episode. She gives number one a helmet, which brainwashes him and forces him to go out on a date with her. And even after the helmet is destroyed, number one doesn't give a shit for some reason and gets ice cream with her. That's kind of weird. He's leaving all his friends there who are clearly hurt, but I guess he's just really horny. We're going to build a wall. President. A lot of this episode is just a big chase as well as an action scene, and they're both really good. There's an android of the president who tries to kill Jimmy as well as number one. He also dies by getting crushed in a junkyard, which is sick. We don't actually see him get crushed to death since it cuts to black, but still, it's legitness. The only nitpick I have is that number two leaves the bus, which means no one is piloting it. Shouldn't the bus have immediately crashed when he left? I don't know, because they never explain it. Also, the the ending is really weird. Jimmy is now evil and works with Father for some reason. They explain why he does this in Operation Snowing, but here it just comes out of nowhere. <laughs> Oompa. Some fat ass kid kidnaps number one's dad and the only way to get him back is to beat him in a tuba battle. The battle is amazing and I laugh every time I watch it. We get to see more of number one's dad which is always good. Also the kid was fishing for dads even though his was only gone for 10 minutes so that's also great. Regular scrape with his fangs and lick up the blood. Lockdown. This is a great way to bring back Count Spankula or I guess the idea of him since he's barely in it. The episode never shows or tells you that Spankula is in the treehouse, so you just assume he is. But then it turns out that he has the ability to turn others into vampires too, which is really cool. Again, the hints are there, there's clearly something wrong with number one, so it's up to you to figure out what the hell is going on. Breakfast. There are other horror episodes in the show, but this is easily one of the strongest. Most of the episode has a red tint, which helps set the tone for how terrified all the characters characters are. The vampire designs are great, and it sucks that we only get to see them for a few minutes. Also, it ends with everyone going to prison and spanking Spankalot's ass. Was that the bite of- 86. Fugitive. A great introduction episode for number 86. She's easily one of my favorite characters since she's funny, her accent is great, and she's a giant asshole, especially in this episode. She yells at everyone, or at least just the boys, since she's sexist, which is epic. Also, since she was and still is a giant asshole, she gets punished at the very end, which is good. Just like Lizzie, I can see if some people don't like her, but at least here she gets punished for her actions. Also, one of the writers clearly has a toenail fetish because this scene is just... <laughs> What the f 
Papa? Johnny, Johnny? Yes, Papa? Licorice. One of the rare episodes where the KND, or I guess just number five, works with one of the villains. Sticky Beard has always been one of the show's strongest villains, and one of the reasons is because he's not just an asshole adult. He does help Sector V from time to time like an operation afloat. The reason he helps number five is because he does oh. like her, and also due to Heinrich previously being his cabin boy. I think my favorite part is seeing how all of these characters are connected in some way. Number five and Heinrich are old friends. Heinrich is Sticky Beard's cabin boy, and Sticky Beard used to be John's cabin boy. Also, I don't know how number five didn't die, or at the very least had a seizure after drinking all that sugar. Finally, there's John's backstory, which is visually distinct and also sounds good too. Was dead, no, not red, and tasted like ass! Silly wabbit! Twigs are for kids! Munchies. Sector V breaks into a supermarket for villains just to steal one box of Rainbow Monkey cereal. There's a ton of villains here, and they even work with Sector V at the end to crucify Night Brace. The supermarket being the setting is both new and unique. The action sequences are pretty good, and overall, it's a lot of fun. I put the new 4Gs on the G. Dodgeball. A dodgeball wizard? Yes, that's what he actually is. Tries to prove that he's the best dodgeball player in the world. It's insanely over the top and stupid, which is why I, as well as others, really like it. That being said, while it's great, there is one problem. Although minor, this feels like a repeat of mini golf with the whole adult wanting to be the best at a kid's sport. Again, it's still great, but it does feel like something the show already did despite it having its own distinctions. Number four is the main focus this time, except it's actually his brother who's the master of dodgeball, which is a good twist. Number two is also here, even though he really doesn't add much. All he does is read the dodgeball message to number four, and that's pretty much it. Also, the dodgeball fight kicks ass. <laughs> Flush. The best Toilinator episode where he beats the shit out of multiple other villains after they take over Sector V's treehouse. The only reason they were able to take over was because Sector V was busy at school. I'm kind of surprised the villains never tried to do something like this again. If everyone is at school, then breaking into the treehouse should be a lot easier. Anyway, I don't know how they managed to do it, but they somehow made the Toilinator actually cool and threatening. His new design is great. It's much more bulky, which makes him look tougher. Also, the end credits is just him getting the shit beaten out of him. I'm with them now. No girls allowed. Outbreak. This is the first episode that takes place shortly after the previous one, which is Operation Virus. There are some episodes like Season 4, Episode 8, which has two food-themed episodes. But in terms of plot, these two are much more unclearly connected. Anyway, this is the episode where everyone thinks this one girl has cooties. It's so over-the-top, funny, and stupid, but even then, it still manages to work as a great horror episode. Also, how the hell was this able to air in the mid-2000s? Number 20,000, who's great by the way, was literally going to 9-11 the base. Number one, patient C is on this. <laughs> Don't let your kids watch John C. <laughs> Well, those were the 8 out of 10s, so now it's time to move on to the 9 out of 10s. These next episodes are great. Not the absolute best, but still solid high tier episodes. Amish Mafia, series premiere, Wednesday, December 12th at 9. Amish. Here's another episode that takes place pretty much immediately after the previous one, Operation Science. Number 2 goes into hiding, so he spends time with the Amish kids next door. I like seeing him be put out of his comfort zone, especially since he's now on suicide. Side watch. The Amish accents are stupid and funny, which is part of the reason why this is notably high on the list. Also, number two is super smart, yet he does something really stupid. He's supposed to be in hiding and isn't supposed to use any 2x4 technology, otherwise it'll attract the enemies who are after him. However, he decides to grow a giant treehouse, which causes the enemies to find him. I'm completely fine with this though, since he does this out of anger and frustration, so I don't think it's out of character. The twist ending is good, although I should have seen it coming since a decent handful of episodes end like this. Also, the end credits are great too. 
float. A great Jaws parody, and also you can shoot me in my cock hole because I'd rather watch this than actual Jaws any day. Number four, wanting to eat a Big Mac is hilarious, especially his face. Also, everyone fucking dies in this episode. <laughs> also, Sticky Beard saves everyone because he's not that much of a piece of shit. Dora gets candy. <laughs> You're old. Grow up. The first two-parter, and it's pretty great, although definitely not perfect. The fight against the delightful children lasts for four and a half minutes, which is pretty long and definitely drags on. Number one sort of acts a bit out of character. He immediately gives up and quote, leaves the KND since he's an adult. He does care a lot about the rules in the KND, so I can believe this, but I could also see him act differently and try to go back to being a kid. Also, yeah, he says he leaves the KND, which isn't accurate because he didn't get decommissioned. He still has all the memories and knowledge of being in the KND, so he's still a member. More importantly, though, him being a dick to everyone doesn't really make sense. I understand he's irritated about being an adult and all, but this I can't buy into. Also, how the hell was he able to get a job in the span of a few hours? And not only that, but he doesn't even have a license, so that doesn't make sense either. But besides those problems, there's a lot this episode does right. We get introduced to Father, who's the best villain in the series. Everything from his design to his fire powers, and of course his voice are amazing. The voice acting in the show is usually great, but Father's is easily one of the best. There's also some neat callbacks like number two wearing the fly suit, hippie hop, and the ray gun from cable TV. There's clearly some pacing issues as well as plot holes, but can Considering how fun most of it is, I can forgive them to a certain extent. This is a great way to end off what is for the most part a decent first season. I'm gay. Slumber. Number 86 has a slumber party, but because she's an asshole and no one likes her, she's forced to ask random people over instead. Number 4 even thinks it's a mission, so he dresses up as a girl which gives off Big Mac vibes. Chad is in it, and he wears a bra, so that's something. The first half is hilarious, but the second half takes a notable tonal shift. Kree and the ninjas end up stealing the code module and the episode ends with them losing. I know there's like 10 other episodes that have bad endings, but still, this is a weird way to end it. Kiss me. Kiss. Uh, hi. I'm ho oh, hi, uh, Hank. This is one of the stupidest episodes in the show. Number two turns into a teenager and tries to suck on Kree's pussy. Even though this is mainly a silly and fun episode, it does continue the plot of Kree trying to destroy the moon base. But yeah, this was always one of my favorites as a kid, and I still love it now. Same. Show. The Grim Adventures of k &D. Here's another episode that I always loved as a kid and still do now. Billy and Mandy is one of my all-time favorite cartoons, so of course I have a ton of fun seeing them interact with the cast of k and Edit and Eddie are also in it along with other easter egg characters from other shows. Even the intro was completely remade and the end credits has a bunch of what if crossovers which is great too. I know I'm definitely rating this way too high since there are some major problems. A lot of characters act really stupid and out of character. For example, number 362 thinks Mandy is number one for some reason, even though she's supposed to be one of the smartest K&D members. Also, everyone starts obeying Mandy for no reason instead of 362, who's supposed to be, you know their leader. I can understand if some characters like Numbers 3 and 4 think Mandy is number 1, but not someone like 362. Also, Grimm thinks number 1 is Billy for some reason, which is kind of annoying too. Maybe if this was a big 45 minute special, then some of these problems would have been fixed, but who knows. It still would have been interesting to see what the writers could have done if they were given more time to work with. Anyway, this special also has one of my favorite fetishes, assimilation. So... Oh, that's hot. Because you're about to go bananas. Follow the moon. Moon. This ham tastes like it's made out of pig. They faked the moon landing. I'll repeat. They faked the moon landing. That's hilarious. Number four and his family get sent to a fake moon the K&D made, except he doesn't know this because no one told him. I got even more enjoyment out of this episode this time around since I watched the Truman Show a few years back and now know that this is a parody of it. Also, the end credits is a great callback to Operation Pool's end credits. <laughs>
naughty. There's a lot of great Christmas specials, and this is definitely one of them. For some odd reason, this is an X-Men parody, but I'm not complaining since it somehow works really well. All the characters' names and powers are creative and memorable. The 12 Days of Christmas has to be one of my favorite jokes in the entire show. One of the elves calls them, and they crush number three. That's literally it. The intro is Christmas themed, which is neat, and the french fries joke is great too. Girlfriend. We finally get an episode where number one has to sacrifice his relationship with Lizzie in order to continue helping the KND. It's a great, somber, and serious episode, and I wish we got some more like this, but with other characters. The plot about the Splinter Cell and the KND continues from previous episodes, and this is also more build-up for Treaty as well as interviews. It's weird to see the treehouse be the villain for once, especially when it's jarring CG. There are episodes that have bad endings where the characters lose, but this is easily the worst of them. Number one loses Lizzie, who he's been with since the very first season. It's a really sad ending, especially for a kid's show. I'm not sure if Lizzie haters like or dislike this episode. Maybe they like it because Lizzie is gone from the show, even though this is one of the last episodes. Or maybe they hate her even more since she dumped number one, even though he's just trying to help others. Either way, I guess number one now needs to rent a girlfriend. What's 9 plus 10? 21. Awards. I'm the winner is... Come. The Villain's Choice Award is such a good idea. The song by Robin Food is catchy, Sector V's plan is so fun to watch, and Potty Mouth is fantastic. One thing that bothers me is that we never find out who won the Villain of the Year Award. Pretty sure it would go to Father, but then again, who really knows? Anyway, I saw someone complain or say that number one should have been replaced with number 86. This would have forced Mr. Boss to team up with Sector V to save her, which sounds like an amazing idea. I would have loved to see this, or at least this concept, be used in another episode. The only problem with number 86 being used as a trophy is that she isn't as valued or hated by the villains. Deal or no deal? Treaty. It's time to rock! This is the final episode in the show besides Operation Interviews, and it's a pretty damn good way to end off Season 6. Chad and Number 1 get to interact for most of it, which is cool. The whole teen treaty with the K and D is kinda dumb, just because it's obvious that they aren't actually going to go through with it. I know a lot of the K and D don't agree with it, but it's still weird that Number 362 believes the teens aren't lying. Anyway, the scene where Chad starts talking about the galactic K and D is fantastic, and easily one of the best best moments in the entire show. I'm fine with them hinting about the Galactic K and D and not explaining much since this technically isn't the last episode in the series. I just wish they got the time and attention they needed in interviews. As for Chad, I'm mixed on him not being a villain. Yes, Maurice as well as others weren't decommissioned, so it's not like this is completely unbelievable. It makes sense that Chad, one of the best K and D members, would still work for the K and D, but I don't know, I like him more as a villain. Anyway, this episode is a bit mixed. Everything with number one in Chad is great, and the first and last few minutes are fantastic. The B-plot is still good, just notably weaker, but it also doesn't take up too much time. It's getting hot in here. It's so hot. hot stuff. Another memorable episode where number three turns into Heat Miser after touching the thermostat. It's kinda crazy how well both the A and B plots are. The A plot has numbers 1, 2, and 5 driving through number 3's house. The action sequences are great, and even visually, it looks great too. Then there's the B plot of number 3's dad dicking around with number 4 at the treehouse. It's just as good as the A plot, and number 3's dad is hilarious. In this episode, Frank, Max, and Idub set out on a journey to collect ingredients for the perfect cake. Caked 4. The fourth cake episode, the first two-part cake episode, and also the second best cake episode. There's a tube racing competition, and the winner gets a delightful children's cake. The race is a lot of fun, there's this funny commentator, and also number 4's tube is called Tubezilla. It's super big, and that's all there is to it, since it blows up within a few minutes. Also, I don't get why number 4 gets stuck on a small island. Apparently, he can't swim, even though he learned how to swim in literally the last episode. Not only that, but the delightful children's cake is made with a different ingredient this time around. Want to know what it's made of? Here, take some time to think.
It's made of kids. Yeah, it's made out of fucking kids. What the fuck? Snowing. Jimmy kidnaps Lizzie and forces her to become his queen by using the boyfriend helmet she used on number one, which is a great callback to season one. A lot of the action scenes are pretty cool. No pun intended. Ah! This is a great Star Wars parody and I love this joke as well. What on earth are you doing? Doing your mom! Also, just like Heinrich, how are the two of them going to stay in prison if they're kids? This is an even bigger problem since they go to school and they have parents who are worried about them. Nice shot! Mini golf. There are some insanely stupid and over the top episodes in the show when this is one of them. Mini golf is a classic and it's crazy that an episode this great was one of the first few episodes. Rupert is a professional mini golf champion. Yes, not regular golf but fucking mini golf. After losing to number two, he shrinks him down to the size of a golf ball and has a rematch with him in his mother's basement. He also wanted to use his shrink ray to shrink the earth and grow huge himself just so he could play mini golf with the entire universe. That's fucking insane and I love it. He somehow has one of the most powerful weapons in the show, yet he just wants to use it to play mini golf. This is exactly how you write a dumb and over the top character. Besides grandfather, Rupert is easily the best one-off villain. I would say I would have wanted to see more of him, but I think he really only works as a one-off villain. The only nitpick I have is that Rupert somehow knows that number two is at the KND treehouse, which doesn't make sense. Throwing flashbang. Maybe if number two said, hey, let's hang out at the treehouse after this, then I could buy it, but he or anyone else doesn't. Again, it's a small nitpick and an otherwise great episode. <laughs> Graduates. For I am Pickle C. Although not nearly as long as the Korean Moonbase arc, the Code Module arc is still fun, and this is a great way to end it. Hey! Father has a device that'll turn all the KND members into animals, so because of that, nearly every single KND member attacks his mansion. Seriously, the amount of members in this one small area is insane, and this feels like it could have been the series finale. Some of the animal choices work really well, like 86 being a dog and number 4 being a koala. Number 362 turns into a monkey, even though someone else would have been a better pick. Boo! It's really clever that Tommy quit the KND in order to not turn into an animal. I thought the ray wouldn't work on him since he's called number T and T isn't a number. Tommy also can't be a KND member again, which is good. If he rejoined the KND, that would have been stupid and made his sacrifice feel pointless. Finally, I can't believe Finger 11 came back to work on KND again. <laughs> Trip. This is pure slapstick comedy at its finest. There are other episodes with good slapstick, but this is easily the show's best. Tara Strong and Tom Kenny use stupid fake Asian accents for 10 minutes straight. Summon our biggest, most destructive ship! Yes! Sister. They get the shit beat out of them the entire time, and the sister slowly goes insane as the episode progresses. But yeah, this is a blast from start to finish. Recruit is a pretty good follow-up, but the twins barely talk in it, and the slapstick isn't quite as good either. I hate kids! Kids are brats! Kids are stupid! I hate kids! Maurice. I love how serious and mature this is. It's a pretty sad episode about number five believing that she lost one of her friends. She also realizes that she won't be a kid forever, which again, is is pretty sad and mature for the show. However, we do find out that Maurice doesn't get decommissioned since some operatives never leave the KND, which is a big reveal. I wish we got at least one episode about him ruining one of Kree's plans without the help from Sector V or other KND members. Anyway, I know this is sort of a nitpick, but this episode creates a plot hole for operation support. Number 5 doesn't believe number 1 when he says Bra stands for Battle Ready Armor. However, in the flashback, the teens are clearly wearing the same armor that Kree wore, so that doesn't make sense. Besides that, it's cool to see Kree fight as a KND member, and this part was amazing too. Steady as she goes, dude, and crank up those tunes. Oh. 
Well, those were the 9 out of 10, so now it's time to move on to the 10 out of 10s. These next episodes are the absolute best in the show. When you think of K&D, these should be some of the first episodes that come to mind. They may not be perfect, but what they do well, they do really fucking well. The Book of Say got Genesis. England. Number 1 goes to England and protects a book from England's version of the delightful children. The chase scene is great, and that's mainly due to number 1 not having any of his 2x4 technology with him. Even on a rewatch, it's pretty difficult to tell who's good and who's not. I love everyone's England accent. They're so fake, which is why they're funny. Saw so those blighties chasing you. Run, run, run down the apples and pears and fruit the baggage and freight. So we thought we'd help, eh? The book number one had was just a rainbow monkey book, even though everyone thought it was the book of K&D. This is actually the first episode to mention the book of K&D as well as number zero. Fun fact, this aired earlier than it was supposed to since Operation Zero was airing in August 2000. 2006. During this time, Season 5 hadn't even finished, but they still aired this since it ties into Operation Zero. I don't know why they didn't just delay Operation Zero or air a bunch of episodes in a week instead. The scheduling for the show is kinda messed up. If you want, you can check out the air dates on Wikipedia for yourself. More like under new management. It. It may have taken a long time, but we finally got a number 362 episode. As leader of the K&D, there's a lot you can do with her, and her not wanting to be leader anymore makes a lot of sense. She has to deal with a bunch of bullshit every day so I could see why she wants to quit. And the way a new K&D leader is chosen is by playing tag, which is amazing, since barely anyone wants to be supreme leader. The best parts of it are easily the ones where numbers 362 and 1 are talking or fighting alongside each other. Number 362 doubts herself and doesn't want to continue being leader, meanwhile number 1 convinces her that she's great at what she does. The first half is the game of tag which is a ton of fun and it ends with father being tagged and becoming leader. I don't know how he got on the moon base since they never bother explaining it. Anyway, father can be leader since he's still a K&D member which is a great callback to graduates. At the end, number 362 becomes leader again by forcing father to tag her since he's scared of broccoli which I'm fine with. However, what I don't understand is why the delightful children decide to help numbers 1 and 362. Number 362 says they help them because they don't like broccoli, but the thing is, father isn't making them eat it. So what, do they just feel sorry for the K&D now, or am I missing something? If it wasn't for this notable problem, this would be ranked a few spots higher. Anyway, besides that, the rest of it is great. Also, father can do the gritty and split himself into multiple entities, so that's cool, but I don't know why he never does this again in the show. He can turn into a dragon in Operation Interviews too, so maybe there's a lot he can do, but chooses not to for some reason. <laughs> not. Another very over the top and sick episode where number one teams up with an adult to destroy a giant snake tie. It's a weird episode and sometimes when the show does something like this it doesn't work like in Shave but here it works perfectly. Musk is great, he's a Russian adult that fights snake ties. That's fucking awesome. There's a giant queen tie that lays eggs and vomits on people that transforms them into people that wear suits and ties. One of the dudes turns out to be Moose's boss's son who tricked him in order to get revenge on him even though he's still just a kid. Moose sacrifices himself by blowing up the giant tie queen. It's so dumb and stupid and I love every second of it. Also, Moose is one of the few adults that number one actually grows to appreciate and like. He even helps him get back to his old self at the end of it. Moose destroys the office again and number one starts laughing. But yeah, it's insanely over the top and pretty much perfect. We gonna make another cake today, man. Cake 5. Say, 19th century kid, you wanna watch a cartoon? On the television? Out of the six, or seven if you count interviews, Cake 5 is the best cake episode. It's the biggest and most ambitious one yet. This time, the cake is a giant spaceship, which is awesome. I don't know how anyone was able to make a cake this big, but I don't care since it looks cool. Half of the episode focuses on Sector V, but the other half centers around number 86 and number 19th century. Like I said before, number 86 is one of my favorite characters, and number 19th 19th century is one of my favorite one-off characters. He's old-fashioned, to say the least, and tells everyone that women belong in the kitchen, so he's pretty awesome. Flying machines in outer space? And girls in the kids next door! 
Next thing you know, they'll let them vote. Also, I'm surprised he didn't pull a Keemstar and say anything questionable to number five. <sighs> anyway, the opening shot looks amazing. And there's this one part where father says he wants to blow up Texas for the hell of it. I wish number 19th century didn't get decommissioned since I would have liked to see him in other episodes. I know that technically he's over 100 years old, but still, come on, that's a load of horse sperm. But yeah, this is the best cake episode, although though still not as good as any of the cake videos. And I said I don't care about IMDb's ratings for this video since all of them except the first episode are an 8 or higher. That being said, this is the highest rated episode according to IMDb, and yeah, it's an amazing episode, don't get me wrong, but there are definitely others that are slightly better. The stakes are super high, Sector V gets decommissioned, number one is about to be as well so he's forced to team up with Tommy. Then Chad, one of the best KD members, turns evil since he just turned 13 and said sends the moon base into the sun. His motivation for turning evil also makes a lot of sense. He's been one of the strongest assets to the KND for the last five years, and he's even been their supreme leader too. But now, all that time and effort won't mean anything to him, since he won't have any memories of being in the KND. This is kinda why I like seeing him as a villain, instead of secretly being good the whole time like we learn in Treaty. There's even some foreshadowing for this when he sees that number one has one of his invitations. It's such a small thing that's easy easy to miss even on a rewatch. Seeing the team get decommissioned and then relearning how to be operatives is also great. Also, I know you're not supposed to take the show very seriously, but there's some things that are just hard to believe. For example, how the hell are they able to pull an entire moon base back with them? Also, when number four breaks a hole into Chad's ship, Chad and Tommy aren't wearing helmets, so they should be dead. Bruh. I know this is a nitpick, but still, it bothers me. It ends with Chad teaming up with Kree, which is a great cliffhanger for season 3 as well as a great send off to season 2. There's a lot crammed in here and I don't mean that in a bad way. It's impressive seeing how much this episode did not only on its own but for the rest of the series too. Bra stands for battle ready armor. Support. Oh yeah it's this episode. Number 1 thinks bra stand for battle ready armor because he's a dumb kid. As a kid I always enjoyed this a lot but as an adult this is one of my favorite episodes as you can tell. I like episodes where Sector V are misunderstanding things that they don't understand since they're still just kids and this is a perfect example of that. I still can't believe the writers were able to get away with this. There's a scene where numbers 1 and 2 are putting on bras and it's so stupid. This episode also introduced Kree and number 5's father who are both great additions to the cast. Finally, it turns out the number 1 was right all along which just makes this even more dumb and over the top. They could have just ended with number 5 yelling at the two of them them, but no, they really went above and beyond here in terms of stupidity. Hey, yo, the pizza here! Report. Hey, this is sort of like Operation Fly, except not bad. In fact, it's awesome sauce. Just like Fly, it's split into five different parts where we see all five members experience something, but in different ways. This time, instead of the music doing all the work, it's mainly the visuals as well as monologuing that tell the story. It's so cool seeing all these different styles in one 11 minute episode. There's CGI, crayon drawings, and of course, DBZ. Yeah, I love all the sections, some more than others, but number fours is by far the best out of all of them. Visually, it's great, but number four's voice is amazing too. Hand it over, delightful lawns, or face the wrath of number four go! There's so much charm and personality poured into each and every segment. Again, it's crazy how much is squeezed into this 11 minute episode. One of the best parts has to be its ending, where it's revealed that everyone just failed to pick up a pizza box. <laughs> future. In this episode, a girl succeeds in taking over the world and almost creates a woman's ethno state. What is this? World's End Harem? <laughs> I know time travel logic almost never makes sense, so just deal with it. I guess there's different timelines or something? I don't fucking know. I like that the villain is a little girl instead of an adult, which is something we don't get to see too often, and no. Fuck Mushi. Also, I don't understand how and why there's just one time travel device, especially when it's right 
right out in the open. Anyway, a lot of it is top notch, but the last few minutes as well as the lesson really make this one of the best. The entire world got fucked up because number four didn't ask his friends for help. So remember kids, it's okay to ask for help, otherwise the world will turn into a woman's ethno state. Pool is closed due to AIDS. Pool. There are worlds inside couches, bathtubs, and closets, but the best of them is by far the world at the bottom of the pool. There's an entire other world filled with the same characters except their personalities are completely different. Father and the delightful children are good, number one is a coward, and number three is a jerk. There's also some smaller details like how number four is the supreme leader, which is a great callback to canon. Lenny is wearing goggles instead of a football helmet, and even the 2x4 sequence looks and sounds different too. Also, number four finally learns how to swim, which is great, even though he forgets in the literal next episode. But yeah, it's a bunch of fun. I'm sure everyone loves it. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. White House. Number one wakes up and is the president of the United States. Number two is his VP, number three is his secretary, and number four is the military general. All of these roles work so well for them, except for number five, who's just crazy and locked up in prison. That's the only thing where I'm like, that's kinda weird, but... Okay. Number one is unsurprisingly married to Lizzie, and they have a son who's the new leader of Sector V. There's some stuff that doesn't make sense, like number one having hair again, even though he's permanently bald for life. The treehouse looks the exact same, and his booger still working doesn't make sense since he's not in the K&D anymore. But this is a dream, so I guess number one just wasn't thinking about these things, so I don't hold them against the episode. Anyway, number one has to sign the bill of no rights for kids, but he's too stubborn and won't sign it. I'd rather say. And that's one of the best parts about this. Number one being very stubborn and refusing to sign this bill, which won't impact any real kids at all. Even in a fictional world where nothing matters, he still won't sign something like this. Just sign the bill and get out! said no the ending is so weird too where he turns into the hulk gets crushed by a ton of shit but then wakes up we also get some foreshadowing for operation treaty and interviews at the end so that's cool but yeah this is the best two-parter in the series it's a blast from start to finish however there's still one 11 minute episode that's better than this as well as something much bigger which is i'm not your daddy i'm your grandpa Operation Zero. Okay, I really wanted to put this as the best episode, but I just couldn't. I thought it'd be cool to rank the best episode at number one and then rank this at number zero since it fits so well, but again, I just couldn't. I'll get to that episode after this, but for now, let's talk about Operation Zero. This movie kicks fucking ass. It's action-packed and tightly written from start to finish. It gave us Grandfather, who's the most threatening villain in the series, and my second favorite villain right behind Father. There are some crazy reveals, like how Number Zero, aka one of the greatest KND members, is Number One's father. Speaking of father, he's Number One's uncle, which makes the Delightful Children his cousin, or cousins I guess, so that's even more crazy. The Delightful Children are also the lost members of Sector Z, which I never understood as a kid and didn't notice until I rewatched this movie. Again. The only time they're mentioned in the series is in this movie, and it's one throwaway line in the beginning of the film, which is very easy to miss. Yes, this is supposed to be some big reveal, but it falls flat because there's no build-up for it. I don't get why they didn't have an episode like England where they mention the Book of K&D in number zero, but do it with Sector Z instead. Or at the very least, they should have mentioned them a few times in season five or something. But again, this literally comes out of nowhere and it fails as a reveal. Another thing that that doesn't make sense is how age-defying works for the zombies. Whenever one of the zombies touches someone or something, they age and become old. This isn't consistent throughout the film though, because number one makes contact with Sector V when they're zombies, yet he doesn't get ageified. Maybe it's because he's not touching their hands, which would make sense. Because if not, then shouldn't everything around them turn old since their feet are touching the ground? Or maybe not because they're wearing shoes? I don't know, and my penis-sized brain is starting to hurt just thinking about 
about it. Anyway, the only other problems are Grandfather wanting to destroy the Book of Candy as well as his plan for world domination. It doesn't make sense why he wants the book because everyone except for number one are agefied zombies at this point. There aren't any kids left to read it unless he's thinking about kids in the future. That brings me to his plan which also doesn't make much sense. If everyone is an old zombie then does that mean the human race is doomed? Is everyone going to die in a few years of old age or are they immortal? If they're immortal then that means kids are extinct. So again, there's no reason for grandfather to want the book. However, if they're not immortal then the human race will go extinct. But besides those minor issues, this movie still rocks. The stakes are the highest they've ever been in the series with nearly everyone in the world being turned into old zombies. The action sequences are some of, if not the best in the entire show. Sector V crashes the scamper into the moon base then sends it all the way back into space and has it explode right on Sticky Beard's ship. Not only that, but this has hands down the coolest moment in the whole series. Sector V crashes the moon base right into Grandfather on Earth. It's so over the top, insane, epic, cool, and I love it. Every time I watch it, I go, holy shit, that's fucking awesome. It's insane how much is crammed into this 73 minute film. They managed to focus the movie on number one, but also somehow managed to give so many other characters enough screen time as well. I don't know how, but yet again, they made the Toilinator threatening, so that's cool. There's also some nice callbacks, such as the recommissioning module being how number 86 was able to recommission Sector V and end. But yeah, definitely not perfect, but still a blast to watch and the second best thing to come from the series. And that's because the best thing an episode of Kids Next Door is... Well, sit tight, ladies and gentlemen, because we're about to have ourselves a food fight. Food fight. When I say this episode kicks ass, I mean this episode kicks major fucking ass. This is one of the art episodes, and yeah, this sure is special all right. There's barely any dialogue in it besides the first and last minute. Everything else is singing as well as instrumental rock music, which had me bobbing my head the entire time. The band Guar did the music, even though they're just rewrites of their own songs. Fun fact, they were going to give the team their original instrumentals to use, but they somehow couldn't find them, so they re-recorded the music for them. And it's a good thing they did, because honestly, the re-recorded versions sound notably better. I listened to their original tracks, and they're pretty good, but the instrumentals sound better here. Also, if you like this music, then go check out some of their other songs. Some of them are pretty good. Anyway, the music is awesome, but the animation is great as well. The show usually looks pretty good, especially after the first couple seasons, but this is without a doubt one of the best looking episodes. The animation is so fluid and it also helps that the visuals are in sync with the music too. <laughs> But yeah, this is the one and only episode that once it ended, I said, wow, that was amazing. At one point, I was honestly thinking about lowering the scores for every episode and ranking this as the only 10 out of 10 episode, but I didn't. I could watch this episode over and over again and still not be tired of it. It's just that good. <laughs> Well, that was all the episodes, but just for fun, I thought I'd rank all the seasons from worst to best. I took all the scores from each episode and did the math to see which is technically the best and worst season. Also, Operation Zero, the Billy and Mandy crossover, as well as interviews won't be counted since they're specials. Anyway, the worst season is... Number 6. Season 1 is by far the weakest season. It's not bad by any means, it's decent, but that's just it it's just decent. Literally every other season is notably better. A lot of episodes are either just decent or good with only a few great ones. Since it's only the first season, many of the episodes are very simple and straightforward, which again, isn't bad. There's a lot of characters in the show and obviously it needs time to introduce all of them. However, so many of the introduction episodes are either, again, just okay or good. The series does a lot more interesting things with these characters in the next seasons, which is why 
season one feels so basic. If you like very simple slice of life stories, then I'm sure you'll like season one a lot more than me. It's still a decent season, but it's easily the hardest one to go back to. Also, like I did in my pony video, I'll list the best and worst episodes of each season. The worst episode is Fly, and the best is Mini Golf. Number five. Season six is good, although a bit worse than the rest of the seasons. This season had an overarching story which focused on the Splinter Cell and the K&D, as well as number one going through training for the Galactic K&D. This is probably my favorite arc in the show just because it's the longest, or at least takes up more episodes than the other arcs did. We got some amazing episodes from this arc, such as White House, Girlfriend, Treaty, and I guess you could count Amish too. That being said, this season does have some issues. This is the last season, and by now you can tell that the writers reached their limits in terms of creative and new ideas. Some episodes like Message, Bridge, and Spinach feel like rehashes of older episodes, which is why they're some of the series' weakest ones. We did get closure on some stories such as the Were Dog Teacher, Lizzie, and yes, even Heinrich, which sucked. <laughs> Another thing that's weird is how mixed the two parters are this season. Girlfriend, Treaty, and especially White House are great. However, Tricycle and Safety are some of the series' weakest two-parters. So yeah, this season is a bit mixed, a bit more misses than the other seasons, but also some very strong episodes too. The worst episode is Caramel, and the best is White House. Number 4. Just like the rest of the seasons, season 4 is pretty solid. As you'll tell by the scores, there's barely any difference between the remaining seasons, so every other season is about the same in terms of quality. Anyway, like seasons 1 and 5, season 4 didn't have an overarching story. There was Operation Chocolate, which was a sequel to Rabbit, which was also in this season. There was also Snowing, which continued the story from President, but there wasn't an overarching story that took place throughout the season. The only big thing we got from the season was the reveal of the teens next door from Operation Maurice. But besides that, all of these episodes are just standalone episodic stories that don't add much to the series lore or story. At least all the two-parters in the season are great. Maurice, Snowing, Cake 4, and Pool are all very strong episodes. We also got the best and worst art episodes, which also happen to be the best and worst episodes in the entire show. Finally, the end credits are now different. We now get to see an extra 30 seconds from the second story of each episode, so that's cool. Anyway, the worst episode is Love, and the best is Food Fight. Number 3. Season 5 is another season that doesn't have an overarching story. The season premiere Elections is a sequel to Operation Snowing, but that's mainly it. We got the best Heinrich, as well as the best Cake episode this season, which is cool. Operation It is awesome, and we even got a kick-ass Christmas special too. The only misses were Diaper, which is one of the worst episodes in the show, as well as Home, which is a disappointing follow-up to Pink Eye. Also, this is the only season to not include an art episode, which is weird. But yeah, not much to say about this season. It's another pretty solid one. The worst episode is Diaper, and the best is Cake 5. Number 2. Season 3's overarching plot is the Code Module arc, even though it only lasts for three episodes. That being said, all three of these episodes are great, especially Graduates. It, as well as Future, are both amazing two-parters, although Fountain is easily the show's weakest two-parter. Despite that, Season 3 gave us three two-parters, which is good since the last two seasons only had one each. The only weird thing about this is that although the season premiere was now a two-parter, the season finale was just a regular episode. I don't know why Graduates wasn't the season finale, that would make a lot of sense, but for some reason it isn't. This season also showed us what it's like for the KND to attend school, which was a smart decision on the writers. It was a brand new setting that also gave us some pretty solid episodes. Besides that, we also got some fun new characters, such as Heinrich and Slippin' Jimmy. Anyway, the worst episode is Castle, and the best is Future. Number 1. Although only by a pubic hair, Season 2 is technically the best season of Kids Next Door. I can sort of see why this is the best, since this is a major step up from the first season. A lot of the episodes are just stronger, more interesting, more funny, and better written. There's still some introduction episodes, but there's less of them, and again, they're typically better too. Even the animation and art style improved a lot, and is more accustomed to what the series grew to look like as it went on. There are some new series highs, such as Support, Report, and End, which are all fantastic episodes. Also, this season had the first overarching plot in the show, which spans throughout the season. I know season 1 technically had one too because of cable TV and I guess fly, but I don't really count that. This season has the moon base in Cree arc, which is my second favorite arc right behind the Splinter Cell arc in season 6. It's not too long, but it's still nice to feel like something is actually progressing while you're watching the show.
The only negative thing I can say is that we got a new series low, which was Operation Shave, but that's really it. Anyway, the worst episode is Shave, and the best is Report. How it feels to chew five gum. What? Stimulate your senses. Holy fucking shit. I can't believe I managed to do this yet again. I can't believe I somehow managed to make yet another multiple hour long ranking video on another cartoon series. After I'm done editing this, I'll be all kids next door out and I hope I don't have to see the show again for quite some time. Anyway, now that this video is done, what's next for the channel? Well, I have no idea because that all depends on you guys. I like and want to continue making harm videos, but if this video does well and gets views, then I might focus more time on these ranking videos instead. I know they take a long ass time to make, but if you guys watch and like them, then it's all worth it. But yeah, let me know what you want to see from me. Do you want more videos like this? Do you want me to only make videos like this? Or do you want me to continue making both ranking videos and harm videos? let me know. Also, if there's a ranking video of a show you want me to make, then let me know too. Maybe if one of your comments with a suggestion gets a ton of likes, then I'll do it. The only thing I won't do is an ongoing show like Spongebob or Family Guy since I like reviewing things when they're complete. I know I say this all the time, but I might take a short break from videos once this is done. Then again, I'm sure it'll only be for like three days and then I'll move on to a new video because I'm a workaholic. I'll take a potato chip. <laughs> and eat. With that, this is the end of the video. If you liked it, you can leave a like, comment, share, subscribe, or even support me on Patreon. Link down below. Also, fuck you, Alpha Gayho. I now have the longest K&D review on YouTube, and there's nothing you can do about it. I can't